Well, it was at a meeting of the Georgia Association of Women Lawyers at the Women's Club in Atlanta, there, 14th and P Street Street. And uh, I, she hadn't evidently been to a meeting for I don't know, ages. Anyhow, she was there, and we sat across the table from each other. What was the club? Women's Club, there, 14th and P Street. That her mother had had to do with the building of the clubhouse. Oh, that's impossible. Right, yeah. Uh, but that's where they, this group met. And uh, I thought to myself, well, uh -huh, just a politician, you know, never comes around and tells the that group. <laughs> Did you know <laughs> uh, her by reputation already? Uh, not, not really, because I didn't pay any attention. I wasn't interested in politics. So it was you a know, name that you didn't even know her name? Yeah, I knew the name, oh. I guess. But, uh, and, but then, of course, the, I believe they called on her to make a few remarks or something, or she may have just gotten up and made them because uh, if she wanted to say something, as you know, she just said it. So, uh, uh, but I, my first uh, experience, I, I really just sort of wondered, you know, I didn't know her. I had a ring on it she admired, or from that, of course, I <laughs> thought she was all right. <laughs> and then, of course, the election, and I wasn't involved in any way in any You don't of remember that. the year that you first This met. must have been uh, 47. Because the, the first election, when she was first elected to Congress, was February 46. So well, I think it was before? after that election then. And then she ran in the primary in the summer, uh, May have been July 17, 46. And then in November, she was again in the general election because of all of these uh, things that happened. And, uh, well, this may have been 46. It was during all those elections. There were right. several of them there. You wrote me that you had first met her in 47, so I wondered if well, you I'm were exact about that. Or I'm not you? positive about that, but I know it was while she was running, before she was, while she was going to run. Uh, campaign may have been on, I'm not sure. And uh, then I don't recall the next, uh, I was in the firm of Andrews and Noll. Andrews and what? Noll, and you got one. A. Walton Noll. Came out of the service and formed a partnership with Neil Andrews, who was then... I knew Neil Andrews. Uh, he was then... Um, U.S. Attorney there, and I was with Walter Nall down the corner, around the corner from Helen's office on the 14th floor of the First National Bank building, with Walton from about the time he came out of service until the uh, space that they were going to have in the 22 Marietta Street building was available. This was your first job, by the way, after law school, you said you... Yeah, you well, I went from the Coca-Cola company to Walton Nall's office. And then when that firm got firmed up, uh, I was an associate. Was, uh, Andrews and Nall, and there were three of us associates. That was the first law firm of, of uh, any moment or something that had, had ever had, had a female associate. Oh, really? I, of course, I didn't know any of this stuff because I've never known I wasn't anything but a person, you know? <laughs> so I never considered anything I did as special just because I wasn't anything. How about others? Did you get some kind of recognition for, for it uh, from others? Even? No, well, I, I don't, I, if I paid any attention to it, I don't know. I remember Helen and, uh, uh, oh, what was that one, Gertrude Garris and some of those older women know, talking about if they hadn't uh, come along, uh, what they did back was making it easier for me, and what I would be doing is going to make it easier for somebody else, and I, I didn't know, didn't ever pay any attention to that sort of talk, because I never had any trouble. Of course, women weren't even admitted to juries. No, George I worked on that a long time. I worked, did a lot of work on that jury thing. I think how much Herm, young Herman took credit for that. Well, uh, I can't think of that woman's name now. He took credit for it, got made woman of the year for it, and I thought, oh, you. I did so much of the work on that. Well, back I to... I even was published in the 
George Barger and all that. And that's where I met Doris Markham and we had, you know, she was trying to do a little thing. And I'd write her something and we'd say, you know, stuff like that. Well, back to Helen. You back met her to at, Helen. At, I met her there, and then I don't remember seeing her again until all that election business was over, and I had left the firm of Andrews and Nall because uh, Nall and I, I mean, Neil Andrews just didn't like me. He didn't, you know, we just were at the Did you uh, disagree so with I, him professionally or his political views? I mean, well, it wasn't his political the, views. It was just his personality yeah. clash. He was the one who supported Helen's position in the county unit case in 1950. He wrote a very fine opinion, yeah, well, which was, uh, eventually becomes the majority of He was, uh, it was, this was just a personality clash. I had been with Walt for so many months before he finally left the uh, USDA uh, district attorney's office and came into the firm, actually, physically in there, uh, that I had, of course, was my contacts, any questions, anything, any work I did all went to the wall. So uh, I don't know what it was, but it was a personality class so now I just left. And I didn't know what I was going to be doing and ran into this Margaret Hills on the sidewalk down at five points one day and we were talking and Margaret says, Well why don't you go up and see Helen? So Margaret right, Hills, can you tell me Margaret about Margaret Hills fairly. Oh, the you lawyer mentioned that her I wrote letter, to you right. about. Who had, if you happen to have her had, address, yeah, by the I way, have, it. have you? Uh, who, uh, uh, she had. I, you, you said that you didn't know there had been a, a federal case. Of I've checked time. into that since I, but I there's wrote some, to you. But there's I, something to do with the ballot box. Right. I, I know Helen about Ma that, I mean, and I didn't realize apparently it was a federal case. It was to, you know, it was a state election. Yeah. It was for a congressman, it was to have the but she must have had to bring it in the federal court. Because um, it was a, 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 a U.S. I've encountered a lot of it in the, uh, in the hearings that um, that I've just been reading this morning on, on the plane. So it, it apparently was in the dis in the federal well, court. Well, ev evidently, uh, most of uh, whoever had been helping uh, Helen uh, uh, legal with her legal business. I don't know if they'd all backed out or what had happened. Anyhow, she went to Margaret, and Margaret did represent her to some portion of that case. And Margaret was the one that suggested that I just go on upstairs and talk to Helen. That she was sort of floundering around up there and didn't have, uh, I don't know when her secretary left or anything. There was no one in the office at all. I just went she was still sharing it with Guy, though? Oh, yeah. Guy had one office, and then there was a reception room, and yeah. she had one. Three yeah. years And Guy didn't have anyone doing his work, and, of course, I had been a secretary at the uh, Coca-Cola company, and I was a lawyer, too, but I just went up, and we just talked. And she said that she and Morris and Hamilton, Jr. were in, involved in all this, uh, one of these county union cases. This year would have been something like 49, perhaps. Our last election was 48. Was it before that? I was with her on the last election, must have been 47 or early 48. She first uh, started to bring that county unit case that you're talking about. Uh, she made her first move to get money, asked solicit funds publicly in January of 47. Well, it was so, sometime early right. in that year then. Right. I would have it. Oh, that's right. You speak of having somewhere. gone to Washington yes. with her for the hearings on the contest, which she brought in the Congress against Davis' election. That hearing would have been in that early '48, but they did. A, she did a lot of going to Washington in '47. Yeah, well, on it. Uh, it must have been '47. I have it. I did. I must have that written somewhere. I don't know. But anyhow. Uh, you know, I don't remember no, I'm dates sure. too well because I had no real reason to, right. and I haven't looked back to try to refresh my memory on them. I'm sorry. So I went anyhow. I went up to see her, and she was uh, asked me to come in. We didn't make any arrangement of any kind. I just I was there, and I did. I helped him a lot of the typing on that suit. And I said, Well, I can just come up and help you for a few weeks, but I'm going to Wisconsin. 
maybe it was July or whatever month that was, and I said, so if it isn't finished, I'm going, you know. <laughs> and I did, wanted was it that a paying clear. arrangement? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, but uh, then I would, if I, I could move my law practice there and take care of mine and hers too, because she was so involved and she had some of these clients still holding over that would come into the problem now and then, and I'd take care of them, but we didn't have any. I guess we probably split fees if there were any fees, but I never saw any fees until not we had a You brought some business in. And uh, then uh, I worked on that with them. And whatever time it was that I was going to leave, I left. I mean, they weren't completed with this. And I said, well, you remember, Helen, I told you when I came in here to help you that I was going to have to go. And she said, well, she did. She didn't understand it all. And I was gone for some time. And then we got back together again after I came back. You went to Wisconsin for a vacation? Yes. Uh -huh. And then, uh, I can't remember a better date. But anyhow, then I was with her there, and we worked, uh, did some law practice, and she was involved in this case uh, that she brought up to took the hearing in Washington, that committee hearing, after uh, Davis had been elected, and she was trying to, not trying to have him not see it. And uh, I stayed with her in her office, <coughs> oh, it must have been a couple of years, but I left because I, she was trying to run my life more than I wanted it to be run. If you know Helen, if she likes you and she wanted to be involved in your life and then she wanted to tell you everything you should and shouldn't do and how to do it and why and when, and I wasn't going to have that happening. She was a good bit older than you. Were. Yes, I would say about 20 years older. And uh, we uh, and we never had any worries about it, but I just knew that I was going to sort of gonna go on out because I wasn't going. To, we were good friends, but I couldn't have her telling me what to do because I was just as hard-headed as she was. <laughs> right, and that was one thing heart. Hamilton Jr. always said: I never could understand, and all the people that she clawed, she never clawed you. <laughs> I said it was because we were so much alike. He never had a fight with her. No. Not even the harsh words? No. Uh, I get mad at her, so mad at her I could kill her upon occasion. But we never, uh, and I would just state my position and that would be the end of that. And she evidently realized that that would be the end of it. And did we you ever expected each other hard headedness. Did you ever persuade her to your point of view about anything? Well, well, we discuss many things, probably in the way she, uh, and I make her go go with me to Rich's to buy some clothes, you know, she got to where she'd wear the same dress for three months if somebody didn't make her change it. So I had every now and then see that she hadn't got new clothes and go shopping and things like that. But as far as her political views were concerned, there was no, uh, there was no reason for me even, I didn't have any myself in those. Oh, you didn't? You know, I was going I to was ask you politically. Years old, and it didn't matter less to me. Yeah. Politically, you you were not too much interested. In no. That, no, I I tried really to sort of stay away from that because I didn't want to be involved. Yeah. Was, Did you appreciate the fact that Helen was on the liberal side of things in Atlanta? Well, she was the most conservative liberal. I mean, if you had to describe Helen, I would say she was a conservative liberal. To explain that to uh, me a little bit. Well, she has I liberal mean, well, we'll ideas on some things, but she was very conservative on many things. But then I think that was true with most Southern politicians on the national scene. They tended to, toward conservatism. And if there had been a Republican Party in the state, they should have all been in it. Actually, Helen was was not uh, she was a maverick yeah, she didn't, yeah i mean yeah. she uh, she was uh, registered as a democrat i suppose just because that's the only party they had if you wanted to run for office you had to just run that way or you didn't run yeah 
Yeah. There was no such a thing as that running in, in, independently much. When she was in Congress, and it wasn't long that she was there, she voted with the liberal wing of the Democratic mm -hmm. Party. Yeah. And uh, she strongly believed that the Democratic Party should remain liberal if it was to stay in power nationally. Yes. Um, one of the reasons why she, they, the power structure in Atlanta was absolutely determined to get her out was that she did vote, unlike any other congressman on the delegation yeah. of that. That is, to the left, if you want to call it that. Yeah, but they must have been satisfied with her uh, politics in all the 16 years she was in the state legislature. Right, she didn't and She must have, have had similar leanings right. and thinkings at that, in that Yeah, there was, there was no issue, though, that... Uh, no, there was no... The whole issue was black. Right, she had... Uh, she voted for, you know, to make teachers' lives more comfortable. Yes. Uh, she voted state highway patrol. And she was very involved in child labor law and that, right. that sort of thing. Right. So that uh, right. she never really had an getting opportunity. Getting on juries that uh, she she must have been politically uh, of a mind with the voters because they kept sending her back and back right. and back. And she eventually had no uh, no opposition in the no. forty. Or the summer of '45, I guess, for the last time. Yeah. She was. Well, anyhow. So you you I left, left her, her office, but we were. I didn't leave her unfriendly. She would rather I hadn't left. And she uh, later said to me, I the only I never knew anything about fees. You know, she'd work and do all these things for these poor people, and if they didn't have anything, of course, she never thought of charging a fee, and even if they could have paid one, she sometimes didn't. And she was still charging uh, depression fees. She says, well, if I ever never did anything else for me in law practice, she taught me how to charge a fee. <laughs> well, tell me about, have you any recollection of any inc incidents, uh, instances, uh, of people who came to her, poor people who came to her for help, and I have pe several she people have mentioned care particular of instances. Many old ladies, you know, who would maybe be a retired teacher. I remember one specifically who was uh, had uh, been principal of the girls' high school. I can't recall her name at all. Well, Helen would sort of take care of these older women whether they were awards of somebody or what, I'm not sure, but she did that in the work. And she saw, I can recall two or three of these older women who died during this period, and she would see that they had a decent burial, or maybe she'd be the only one there. And she'd go out and she'd, she'd uh, talk uh, Patterson into giving them a, what she considered a decent, nice service according to their previous standards. Who would pay for it? And well, she would just talk him into doing it. Oh, I or for such little money that there would be enough in this little estate that she could pay him maybe three or four hundred dollars. And the day that she died and Guy went out there to talk to him about uh, Helen, he said, well, this is one time she's not going to be here doing the job. <laughs> Was she, was she cremated? She, yes. Uh, no one saw her after because her body was just so, so broken up. She was on the table with uh, Dr. Smith there for hours. The guy had had an opportunity to get there and was, he said her arm kept falling off the table and she put it back up. But she never was she was conscious. conscious. She was conscious. She was in deep shock, I'm sure, but she was Die, am I going to make it this time? You know, yes. die, am I going to make it this time? Sue and Margaret would tell me. And, uh, and she had, which Dr. Smith said was a good thing because she just, there's no way. Practically every bone in her body was broken. There's so many of them that it was just impossible. But he was working on her as long as she was in. And whether or not, if she had not insisted on going to Embry and they're calling you know, Dr. Smith, uh, she had a lot of consciousness. She was conscious enough that she <coughs> oh, insisted yes. on uh, that? From the time, uh, who knows how long she was there before she was found, or whether 
If there was any other car involved, I don't think anybody knows. Yes, there was. She hit another car. And, and uh, he wasn't injured. And uh, so evidently he went then for help. How long she was there before the ambulance arrived, I don't know. But she never would allow that ambulance to take her to Brady Hospital. Helen Bullock she tells me that she had a, a note on her body, which she'd had for many years, carried it, saying, if I'm in an accident, do not take me to Brady. And they, and they were insisting on taking her there, and she refused. And at the top of her lungs, which you know was, could be pretty loud, but she was. Uh, but they finally did then take her on to Emory. But whether that would have made any difference, that time lapse, I have no idea. Take her to Emory and call Dr. Smith. How long she went before he was able to work on her, I don't know. Let me just ask another thing about get to the end before we get back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, her sister Jean, from the time I met her a couple of years ago, uh, said Helen kept getting younger as she got older, meaning that she literally subtracted from her age. And well, I, um, I know that she had to falsify her passport to go to France. She had to add a year because she was too young. But apparently it's true that she did <laughs> publish an age which was two years younger than her literal age. The reason for that was that uh, Guy was younger. Oh, he was? Yeah, and she wasn't really older than him. And also, uh, whether, the, I'm not sure, but they all always celebrated their birthdays as, as being on the same day. At least she made that decision somewhere along the way, you know, on September 11th. That was Jean's birthday and, uh, as well. Uh, that they were born the same day and were the same age. So I think Guy was a couple of years younger than she was. The uh, death certificate uh, said she was 61, having been born in 1894, which Jean says is the correct age. There's no birth certificate for me to go and verify. But all of her, the obituaries, uh, and also the age that she published when she was elected to Congress was 49. That age when she died, which was 10 years later, was published in the obituaries nationally everywhere. It was 59. She was, according to the death certificate, actually 61. Yeah. So, and so I would say this bears be Jean out somewhat. Mm. I thought that Jean was <laughs> no, <laughs> just no. telling another. And I'm not sure, and I was never really, uh, after other than that, I wasn't really sure whether they actually were born on the same day. I mean, if they had the same birthday or if they just celebrated it together. I'm not sure about that either. Which is neither here nor there, I guess. Yeah. Well, she, uh, Helen and Jean were born on the same day. And the, the figure 11 uh, is very prominent in that family. They, all, uh, they were all born on the 11th of the someone. Well, after you left Helen's office, I the went, year of which you, yeah. you don't really remember for sure. Uh, 49, I think it was. Um, I have those dates, I think. Oh, I don't know why I didn't refresh my memory. And I went over to the 22 Marietta Street building just for a matter of months. And then I decided I had married in 47, so I... Uh, you were married to an Atlanta, by the way? He was living in Atlanta, but he was from Danville, Virginia. And... Uh, uh, was his name Anderson? Bruce Anderson. We didn't, things weren't going too well or something, and I decided, well, I'm going to just quit and be a housewife and make him responsible. So I did that, and then during that year that I didn't work, I was uh, president of the Women's Chamber of Commerce. I was involved in the Women's Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, what was your maiden name? You would have used Wallen, your maiden name. W -A -L -L -I -N. Wallen. Wallen. You would have used that name when you were working in Helen's office. No, I think I was married. I was married in Oh, that's right. Early January. So I think I was after I was married. After the fact. But anyhow, uh, we saw each other and uh, during the years uh, from about the first year I knew them we knew them we had this thing where they would come to our house for Thanksgiving and we would go to them for Christmas 
killing guy that went on over several years, well until she died. And uh, so our life was social. But, but after I went to, to the district attorney's office in September of 1952. Who was the district attorney at, at that uh, time? Paul Webb was. Then that was, was U.S. Paul. district attorney? No, no, this was in the state. Paul Webb was, well, and that time it was, they were called the Solicitor General. Right. He was Solicitor General, and I was, I worked on his campaign, sort of co-managed the downtown campaign office that spring. They had a, a spring um, primary that year. And then uh, after the election, and this thing came up, uh, when it Uniform support of the Penance Act, which the district or the solicitor general were to administer, so he didn't have anyone do it, and asked me if I would come down to the office, and I decided I would, and so I went down there in September of '52. Well, I hadn't been there, and Helen knew nothing about this. I, that was one of those things. I would just learn that I would do what I wanted to do, and then just tell her. Otherwise, it was, I just didn't want to not, you know, get into any hassles with her, so. I went down there, and uh, that was quite a shock to her, I think, that I was doing all this out there on my own, and she didn't know about it, because uh, I think she would like to have had people think that she was responsible for that, and didn't have a damn thing to do with it. Did she approve but of the work itself? Yeah, but after I had gone down there, oh, she... I, when I told her I was going, she said, she thought it was fine, and she wanted to know about it, and I told her about it, and then she said, well, there's one thing about it. Now, you get there in the morning. It doesn't make any difference when you leave in the afternoon, but you be there in the morning because people call. <laughs> the public office, they expect you to be there. They don't really worry too much about it. Yeah. But I learned later, not too long after that, that she had gone, that she had called on the, to the Paul Webb after I'd gone to work for them and had, uh, had it out with him that if I was going to work there as an assistant, she wanted me to have the same amount of money as anybody else did. You know, she went down there behind my back and I'm uh, and not knowing anything about it and was drawing with him about uh, the treatment I was going to receive as an assistant in that office and it wasn't going to be any different from that, any male assistant. <laughs> Did uh, uh, she have any effect, or was it just well? It didn't make any difference away, because I, mean, you uh, got it anyway. I got it anyway. But she was going to be sure that I was going to have what I should have. Was this a kind of a, a tendency on Ellen's part to meddle, or, or is it well, just her attitude toward her friends? I of think, a mother hen? Well, I think she. I think that Helen thought as much of me as I did of her, which was a very close thing. She, I don't know whether she meddled with other people or she, anyone that gave her an opportunity to, to, to have an opinion would get one, which was fine, you know. If you want to know what I think about it, I'll tell you. But if you don't want to know, don't ask me, because we're going to be honest about this whole thing, you know. And I've had that same during these years, uh, the only one of her family that she really got along with, and it uh, was Hamilton Jr. I mean, they could they could uh, yeah, apparently. discuss and discourse and, and do things together and have lawsuits and and uh, didn't have problems with the rest of the family. Uh, she had the she greatest of affection and respect for him. I was aware of this, even though my relationship with him, especially in his last years, was very hurtful. Have you any idea why that was? <laughs> what was it about young Hamilton that was so congenial? Well, to I think when Guy Jr. left, that she sort of transferred that affection, and she was just, and there was a great affection between Guy Jr. and Helen at one time. He, young guy has said to me that uh, spoke and I about think how she close they were. transferred that affection to Hamilton, and he was there, really willing and able to absorb it. I suppose. 
But she had uh, great respect for him uh, as a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, his opinions, intellectually. Yeah. Although I don't really consider Helen too intellectual. <laughs> no, but she was not in great shakes as a lawyer. As someone has said, I think it was Mackie, that she was an activist rather than a thinker in mm -hmm. the sense I think that's... And uh, operated off the seat of her plane. All emotion, just all emotion. She instinctively knew what was right yeah. in a situation and operated that way. But did uh, you said that she wrote that, that she was no great shakes as a lawyer? But how was she as a as a thinker? I mean, to be a, a, a lawyer, and she did have respect. Oh yes, I'm uh, not saying she wasn't any good. But what I mean right. is she well, there are other people who've said her. exactly what, uh, what you said. Uh, but she could get business, and she could finagle. And she would work around, and as I say, when she heard your story, she instinctively knew, without even probably realizing that that law book was going to agree with her instinct, that this is the way this problem should end up or work out, and she would just work at it in that, in that way. And uh, she was needs. very honest as far as her personal life was concerned. But if she could do a little hanky-panky for her clients, she wouldn't mind doing it. You know. Did she, to your knowledge, ever get involved in any kind of hanky-panky that was, that could not be false with the people? No. Not, uh, she didn't have that much, by the time I got know her and was with her, her law practice was just sort of almost over because she had been so involved in this political thing with the Congress that she just didn't have time to devote to any of the law practice. And then she built it up a little bit again after. And, uh, but uh, she had very little law In the, in the last years time. of her life then, her law practice really, you, you feel that it was secondary and if it was secondary to, the, what was it secondary to? No, I don't think after she finally discovered she was out of politics. That Which was, was 48. Secondary. She lived another eight years after that. And then apparently I think she her, left about twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Then I think that her, uh, from then on, it was her law practice. She just got back with it. But it was again, it was that type of practice. It was a she that was sort of a fixer of situation. She um, she made some money, but she, she learned how to charge fees at that point. And you think that you helped her learn how to yes, charge fees? Yes. No, um, the, uh, the property, did she, she bought apparently uh, They had a property. good bit of property down there around uh, Loblolly, around the lake, out of the corporation. And they also and bought she, additional, oh, you mean the additional that they bought was outside of the corporation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had additional property outside the corporation adjoining. But the property that was incorporated was just around the periphery of the lake. And I don't know how far back it ran, but they, the property between that and the road was there. And it had a pretty good stand of timber, which I think they sold off about in that period in there somewhere in the maybe early 50s, and uh, she was, she could make a dollar go farther than anybody I've ever known. I can remember her sitting there saying, uh, talking about the difficulties they had after, during the Depression, the guy lost his job and all this stuff, that, uh, uh, the, how hard they worked the first day that they, they felt like they could spend a nickel and stop and have a Coca-Cola, you know, something that didn't have to be spent. And how, when they didn't really have enough food hardly to eat, she still set her table with the china and the crystal and the silver because she was determined that Guy Jr. was going to know the proper way to do things. And, and that sort of thing. She was a very stickler for, for properness and Ways. This she is what Nancy Downing says, by the way. Most <laughs> you conservative in her yeah. approach to 
mm -hmm. things of that kind. And uh, money was... She didn't throw any money away. She spent a lot of money on politics, but she knew she she could see where it was going, to, where she was going to have it before she spent it. Mm -hmm. And she I had... don't know that she ever got a whole lot of uh, contributions, particularly I... not at the end. No, when she uh, advertised listed for public support for the county unit case in January of 47. Um, I have a copy of the ad. She said that she this would have been at the end of her three campaigns in 46. And what she said in the ad was, I have used up every cent of my own personal funds. And she said that uh, four-fifths of the money that it took for these campaigns, she had, had come Paid out of her own it. pocket. I believe every word that Helen says. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, that, I'm like sure, that. is true. Because, uh, uh, and she would discuss it with Guy and point out where they could spend, of course, $10,000 in that time bought something, you know. I don't know how much she spent on this campaign. And Guy would plug along and he'd bring in some money. I don't know how I have any idea what his income. I have no, I've been, not been able to, to find that out either. Uh, All I, I know is that she left about uh, $30,000 in cash, in savings accounts, um, and bonds, according to what was in the will and the, um, the papers that, that Margaret let me have you access to. You didn't hand it to any uh, uh, copy of the income tax return. Um, she I has published so she in this. Well, I'll 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 make further efforts. Um, I'm not she sure that it. she. <laughs> did you ever meet her? Oh yes. You did. I knew her. Jean uh, Smith tells me that she was she who introduced Guy to this woman, and uh, but she, nevertheless, Jean knows nothing whatsoever about her. Uh, Margaret Douglas tells me that she was a teacher in Macon. Yeah. And it seems that possibly I'd go through the school board down there. She but yeah, I haven't yet was a teacher. Oh, she must have been retired. She could conceivably be dead by now. Right. Uh, and she was, uh, I don't think she'd ever been married before. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, Guy was telling me about her shortly after they met. Remember where they met? Maybe at they Jean's did meet at, at Jean's house, house right. uh, um, at Christmas or something like that. Whether it was down Some at holiday. the lake, I don't know. I um, believe it was. It seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he went to Macon a few times. And anyhow, the young guy said that he simply had to have somebody yeah. to look after. Uh, well, and, and that's true. But then at the same time, I always felt that the guy would. Uh, Helen would have been much worse off alone than Guy was. You think so? Yes, because uh, where she was, she it's was very dependent on Guy. Yeah, that's one of the things I want to talk to you about. I, I, my, <laughs> I guess I've learned more about her than I ever knew when I knew her. But my feeling is that maybe she's a woman who should not have been. Um, I have a feeling, like in some of these things, these, uh, that I'll show you some of these clippings in a few minutes. I have a feeling in some of the things that she's quoted on in the news interviews that she gave to newspapers is that she was really kind of painting herself as a womanly woman because almost as though she felt she had to do this in order to be accepted in a way that would make her more acceptable. Well, I And I almost have a feeling that this wasn't the Helen. Now, I'm, I'm probably, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I wonder what you think about that. I've known several people uh, that, that like that. that just Let me get you this quote here. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to find it very quickly. I remember one time in her office, she clipped from a paper or a magazine a of the uh, two children, sort of waifs, uh, like walking up a road with nothing, 
nothing ahead of them, just there, these two little children. And she came in one day and she taped this up on the filing cabinet. And she says, Amber, you see that? That's what I'm working for. And, and tell me again about this. I'm, I'm looking at this and I didn't really hear it. She clipped. It was either in a magazine or it was just a, a publication print of some picture, whether it was a photograph or a painting. But I have a feeling there's probably a photograph. And this, these two little kids, a boy and a girl, sort of walking that way toward a big a void out here. And uh, she, uh, there was something about that picture that grabbed her heart. And she clipped it out and she brought it to the office and she taped it up on a filing cabinet. And she turned to me and she said, Amber, this is what I work for. But the idea of that would have been that she's working for a better future for, for the young. Right. right. But it really wouldn't have said much about... Do you feel that it uh, meant that she... She had wanted to... for children? Or well, that, maybe wanted to make this a better world for right. whatever came That's behind her. That's what I could see yeah. in that. Possibly. Plus, she was very ambitious and sort of... Very well. ambitious. She never did use... Uh, her uh, position either in the legislature or in the Congress, which was a very short time, of course, for social purposes, because she had very little social life and didn't care for it. Right. They claimed that uh, in the February 46 election that she used her position in the legislature to get her property taken out of the Union City well, it's possible. limits. Why not? <laughs> Curtis, well, Curtis Bryant said it was so bizarre with him that she did this, but uh, yeah. he apparently was one of those who attempted to uh, use it, this fact on behalf of Tom Kemp to paint well, it as a dirty they deed. used everything they could use, right. of course. What I wanted to find for you was a quote that she had that I found after she was elected in 46. Mrs. Mankin's idea of a social evening is a good dinner served on a well-appointed table mm -hmm. and followed by an evening of argument of the issues of the day before a living room fire. This is what she said. Yeah. And that was true. Yes, I think so. Well, going back to this picture of these two children, of course, she was very, uh, very proud of her, the work she had done there child labor legislation. Speaking so of her home and family, Mrs. Mankin emphasized, and this was an interview that she gave in May of 45, before she found the mm -hmm. um, a young woman on the Atlanta Journal. Mrs. Mankin emphasized, they've always been the most important things in my life, my home and my family. Mm -hmm. My home comes above everything and everybody. My business is important, but secondary. And as she talked about Loud Lolly, the country home from which she and her husband commute to work every day, it was plainly evident that brilliant as her career has been, here is a woman who would not hesitate were it to come to a choice between home and business. Do you think that she would willing, willingly have chosen um, her home over her business? By this time, of course, it was the law, and she was very much into politics, and her ambition to go well, to Congress was emerging. Right, and, and uh, she'd still be there if she'd have been elected, because she would had. Uh, my feeling is that yeah. had Helen been a woman of the Midwest, had her family stayed in the Midwest, Iowa, Wisconsin, anywhere <laughs> outside of an area where the Negro problem was was acute, still be uh, that she would have been elected as a young woman and would 
would stay forever. She was an ideal material right. for Congress, uh, for, for national politics. She had everything to make her, by heritage, by training, by instinct. Well, we're back to the question. Do I think would she would she have, have given up her willingly career have for a <laughs> I mean to say, I have the feeling that she simply one of the things where Helen is probably making a, staking out a position <laughs> which mm -hmm. she thinks looks good, yes. but which is perhaps not really what Helen yeah, uh, well, would have done had it come down to it. I, I think that she was very much a woman who had to have An her outside own life, yeah. uh, her own life, and she yeah. led her own life. I agree, but uh, at the same time, she did keep a home and did it nicely was important to her. Well, but if she sort of, <laughs> it, of course in this day, this is 1945, yeah. and until long but after she this, died. She had, had she been elected to Congress, and that fury, the furor that was going on and caused her to uh, be, uh, well, at that one election, I think she was probably real right. They just stole it away from her. Oh, indeed. Uh, There's no question. Uh, and they did it on purpose. They, yeah. They had to. And uh, had that period, she just did this at the very wrong moment. If her, it had her, even yes, been two years yeah, later. She, she occurred at a watershed, you know, yeah. like when the South was emerging from right. all of these racial binds. But it before wasn't they even had arrived. emerging at, from them. Nobody well, even. Well, but it was the first time the blacks had voted. Right. In had she a had been primary. elected a couple of years before, or a couple of years after, mm -hmm. if that those first couple of elections had gone and they discovered that the world wasn't chicken little, the world wasn't going to drop on your head, mm -hmm. then and had then run, uh, she probably would still be there if she were still living. Right. Oh, no question. She was. Uh, and she times. would have, and she right. would have. I mean, she would not have said, well, this is the year I should just go home, as long as oh, she was no. able to go. And I think that uh, her ambitions so and... Uh, I don't know who would have ever put the question to her, or how it could have ever come up, which are you going to do with your career or your home? But, uh, don't but still, in, the, in what I was really trying to get at is that in these years, um, a woman who... <laughs> who purposely put career ahead of home, uh, politically might have had a little harder time yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think that was just... Well, uh, sure. I'm, I'm just wondering what your opinion is. That well, that I'm sure that was just conversation. She was not a dissembler. No, in any she case. was... Uh, I think if there's anything that's true about Helen Mankin is that she <laughs> was so honest that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what she said, you simply had to believe this is what mm -hmm. she thought. Mm -hmm. And yet she could um, perhaps adopt a position publicly that was not really a reflection of, it, you know, that it really come down to it. Um, I, young guy tells me, for instance, that when they came back to Atlanta in 31, um, it was kind of a sacrifice on, on his father's part because she well, felt she had to um, practice, had to come where she could practice right, law. Right, because he wasn't doing anything and jobs were not available. Well, am I, is that, uh, well, am I wrong in that? I understood that he was working for McGraw Hill. Well, I uh, understood ed from her uh, that uh, he had lost his job in Chicago. In Chicago. Well, all right. And they that had to do something. Back. And so and this is the place Atlanta was the place where she knew people and where she could probably start something and he could uh, get a connection of some sort too, probably there easier through her, I don't know what went through her mind, I, but I well, know that they came young, there. Because young guy speaks of the family because connections she, that she uh, Because she, that was the place where she could do something. Mm -hmm. And after all, she was a lawyer and she did have a career and would hold them together for a while, I suppose, yeah. until he could get started. He, uh, when he, when they came back, he went into business on his own. Uh, well, he was a manufactured representative yeah. when I knew him, and I assume that's the type of thing he'd done all the time. He, 
I mean, after, when, at, when they came to Atlanta. Mm. She, when she was interviewed rather extensively when she first went to Washington, mm -hmm. said, uh, she was one of the first women in Congress out of the South. Mm -hmm. It was said that she was the first one out of the Deep South, although Hattie Carraway had been in the Senate from Arkansas, and Ruth Brown Owen Rhoda had been in Congress from Florida. But Ruth Brown Owen was really a Midwestern, and the women had been in Florida. Uh, Florida really was not, she was not a really a woman yeah. of the old South. So that when Helen goes to Washington she, in 46, she was interviewed extensively, uh, and I don't know if you remember, she, she's interviewed here, she's giving a lot of recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Southern corn, dark uh, cornbread and broiled chicken and cornmeal pancakes and sweet potato pudding and pecan macaroons <laughs> and uh, I, I co copied some of the recipes down they sounded very good I hadn't mm -hmm. I hadn't seen them at the time and pictures of her over in her kitchen stove and owing in her garden but here was another great one I was not really introduced was of the shooting Apparently she was a crack shot. Did you know well, anything about her? Uh, I've never seen a, a, her anywhere near a gun, so I don't know. <laughs> she could have been. They lived down there in the country, and she may have had a gun handy. I never saw it. When they went on this long trip west, she and her sister Jean, mm -hmm. in the early 20s, her father gave her a pistol to carry oh. them, And apparently the only thing they used it for was to shoot a rattlesnake in <laughs> Arizona. <laughs> That's probably true. Did she ever talk about th this trip? I knew this they had trip? gone on that trip, and uh, it must have been sort of hairy. But well, it was, it was rather unique. Um, Jean has given me the scrapbook, one of the few, yeah. um, what you might call papers, sets of papers, <laughs> that I have um, been able to find and make use of. A huge scrapbook. These things were published in she did some writing on that trip. trip. Mm -hmm. A long series. And then they went uh, after that to uh, to Europe on a similar expedition. It wasn't quite as spectacular as um, the one to, to the West. Although it was. And they might have gone again somewhere, but, but Jean got married. Well, I don't know. I know she, well, at least uh, my recollection, or at least what she told me, about when uh, she and Guy met, they met in Havana, Cuba. Yes, that's and, right. And uh, some, I don't someone had a dinner party or what, and they, they brought this man in, this evidently an extra man or something. Because there he was, of course, you know, Guy stuttered. And uh, I, think, life, uh, I think, I uh, think, and she, I think it, it, it sort of, she felt, I think her first feeling for Guy was one of pity, sort of. And they, how that developed and where they were married, I don't know, but I know they met. Yeah, they she they were married in Atlanta, and they were married a week after they met, she has said. Well, uh, Nancy Downing doesn't remember the date, but she says that they were married in Atlanta, and she, Nancy, was on the wedding. And, uh, I don't think she had seen Guy Jr. She said he was a pitiful little creature. I don't know where he was living, he but he wasn't living with his father. He had been with uh, some relatives up in Maryland. Yeah, he wasn't with his father. And she took him in and just made, made him what he is. There's a lovely picture. I may have it. Um, she published it in some of her campaign literature. Um, and she just... Uh, well, of her legislative campaign literature of her and young Guy, which is one of the most beautiful of her that I have, and it's, as you're speaking of the picture that she posted on her wall about her children, it, um, I think that, uh, if her father hadn't captured his heart, that child would have yeah, let me see captured if I her heart. Find that. Okay. And she took him, and um, she said he was just piffle. Yes, I had. I met him the first 
time I ever saw him or met him was uh, I went out to the airport with Hamilton Jr. the night that he was coming in for her funeral. Uh huh. And saw him there, and I had him at my house for his dinner. And somewhere along the line, I think he and uh, Hamilton and I both had the feeling that he and Louise thought we were uh, trying to cheat them out of something, you know, which was no, no anything. So. <laughs> Louise, which had she met? No, this was later. This was at the time of a guy's funeral. Young guy has five kids, you know. And, uh, yeah, well, that's one of the things. Did, I guess you never met your wife. His no, wife. I, I just seen him two or three times. I never met him until he came in. I thought it was just so pathetic the, the way she wanted so much to really to really get back with him and never did. Helen did. And, and, uh, Guy Sr. said the last time, he says, I don't know what was said, but the last time they saw each other, they evidently both had words, said things that should never have been said. They just had a terrible yeah. fight. Well, let me get on to that then, because that's something that I'd like to have you tell she me. She came you know back, about. and she was so furious. I don't know whether you ever uh, experienced or saw her in one of her furies, but it was something. No, I guess I never did. And she and poor guy, of course, got the brunt of many of those, particularly about Junior. I remember one morning they were late coming into the office, and guy was just like this. This was when you were still. Yeah. There. And she had been up east and had seen guy Junior, and came home, and guy, guy peace, got peace this out of guy as time went on. She came home and she would just go into rages. She'd think about something and she would just go into rages. Everything that was in the house that would even resemble that boy took it out and just smashed it. Just, you know, yeah. just broke up everything. And, well, uh, was the. And uh, the, the only thing I could ever get out of her, the only thing that I could ever see, uh, number one, of course, she didn't want him to do anything that she didn't want him to do. And ev evidently, uh, in her own way, uh, did just did his thinking for him and everything else all the while that he yeah. was growing up. And then he, when he got out from under, where they had this great, great affection and love for each other, that he got away from it, as I did. I loved her, but I wasn't going to be there and have her controlling my life. And uh, uh, she went up at least twice that I remember and saw him and tried every way she, he was going Before with this girl. Down. Yeah, going with this girl. And the only thing that I could ever see that was that she was really against as far as the girl was concerned was that she was Catholic. This is what they And uh, I said, well, Helen, what, you know, how can that make that much difference? What difference? Oh, well, you've never been in South America. You don't see what that church has done to those poor people. And then she'd go into that, you know, and that was all she could see. The way these, I remember she used uh, examples like uh, no money, you know, these poor people. But then the church would sell them these damn candles and burn them at the altar and instead of buying uh, something to eat. And that sort of thing that she just was so dead set against the Catholic Church, that that was the thing that she zeroed in on because that woman was Catholic. Now, whether there'd have been some other something, the reason why he shouldn't marry her, if she hadn't had that one, I don't know. But anyhow, he did go ahead, he did marry, and they had children, and I don't know what all, but Ellen never, whatever, she went up the last time she saw him, evidently, to make one more effort to talk him out of it and got nowhere, and that was the time the guy said that he said, I don't know what was said, but I know that the thing was said on either side, both sides. She asked them, Elizabeth, his wife, tells me, she and Gary talking about it, that she had asked them to wait a mm -hmm. year, and they, Elizabeth said that, that she 
didn't want to because she knew, she felt, that if she waited a year, Helen would, wait see, another year. Helen would see to it that she never knew. And, well, uh, and incidentally, now, at this point, in her life, Elizabeth is not bitter towards Helen. She uh, um, says that it's a great pity that they never got to know each other. She feels that they would have had much that they would have enjoyed in each other. And that she, Elizabeth, would like to have known Helen because she feels that she was a woman of considerable substance and character. She also says that she has come to feel that many of the good things in yeah, Guy himself came from Helen. I think so. I'm sure that because I know she doesn't worship and that was so unfortunate and that's why I say that's why I think when, when that when they had their difficulties as when she transferred that affection to Hamilton Jr. Yeah. Very she in her will there's a, there's a clause that says not one thing no. of mine is to go to Guy Jr. She left it stand. She oh, yeah. didn't. She meant it. Didn't she leave him out. She specifically denied him. Um, and as I said, young guy, still harbors the deepest resentment. To her. Um, he speaks of her. He did when I first spoke to him. Wrote to him, and then he called me on the phone in great fury. <laughs> How come you're talking to me about that woman? Oh, really? <laughs> well, big old home, sitting on the, one of the rivers in Connecticut. An old house with 15, 20 rooms, which they've remodeled. She's in the antique business and has done very well at it. The young guy was in um, the same thing that his father did for for a while. They apparently had a hard time to start with. They went from uh, New Jersey, northern New Jersey, into Connecticut and decided to, to move over there, picked out Kent, and had, he had a hard time establishing himself, and she was having a lot of babies. So they didn't get along financially too well at first, but then things did go very well with him, and he got into real estate and was building a great deal. He built several things here in, in, in Kent, but got caught in this latest real estate bust. And when I was there in fall of 76, he was, had just about gone bankrupt. And I understand that uh, things even got worse. Margaret tells me that she thinks he's uh, recouped somewhat, but I haven't talked to him, so I, I, don't, I don't know. But, um, well, what about Guy Sr.? He never will. No, I don't know. I, it's not in Hamilton's papers. No, I, I didn't. was wondering if there was anything there that Junior got after his father died, or if this woman just pulled it all off. Um, I don't know. Perhaps I ought to try to find him out. Oh, and I don't know what difference that would make to your story. Well, not too much, I suppose. Um, Do you, young guy, and also Jean, her sister, tells me that that they think, and, and Helen apparently said herself, I wonder if she said this to you, that one of her feelings, one of the causes for her feelings against the church, against the Catholic church and Catholic religion, was a young man to whom she was engaged in the early 20s, and the date I can't fix, no one can tell me for sure who had backed out of, uh, he'd actually given her a ring. Jean uh, tells me that she knows there was, they did get that far because she, Jean, saw the ring. But Jean can't remember his last name. She only knows that his name was Charles. And that because they had gotten a special dispensation from the bishops in Savannah to be married, they'd even gone that far. He was Catholic, of course, and Helen was they were Unitarians, but that he backed out at the very last minute. And he backed out. He probably refused to sign the thing. <laughs> well, 
whatever it well, is. Well, Sue, Sue Berry, this Hamilton's, young Hamilton's sister, tells me that she heard the story from Helen many times. She never told me of that. Never mentioned it? No. The, my whole feeling as far as the politics of her was, you know, she and Guy lived in South America for several years. And that's where she really saw it at work, you know, the, what the religion was doing to the poor people. That's what she liked it all on. And that's where I thought her, uh, she, and she, she was engaged to some, someone else or, or anything. She never mentioned it at that point? I mean, not when I asked her, not when I asked her. The only thing she made it on was what she observed when they lived in South Did she ever, because this is a general feeling about the Catholic Church, and even uh, the Catholic Church outside of the U.S., did she feel that she'd seen enough of the girl to feel that the girl was a Catholic of this kind, uh, would use the Catholic religion? Well, I think she felt like anyone who was born and raised in it and stayed in it uh, must believe it all, and she couldn't understand how anyone could do that and, and have any sense or something, you know, which is, was from the way she felt about it. And I don't think it would have made any difference I don't know if it would have made any difference who he was going to marry, if she thought he wasn't ready for marriage or whatever her real reason was, but that's what the reason she gave him. Do you think that she had any kind of unnatural affection for the boy? I don't know. Other than just she, the, her maternal instinct was just so, so deep. Smothering? She, I think she, well, she did, that was some of Helen's life. You were either smothered or you were clawed. That's what and you there was, And there was, uh, could be one thing this, this morning and then something else this afternoon. But if you were being clawed, it was for your own good. <laughs> oh, it was, as the guy senior said to me that day, one day we were talking about it. It's like living with an eagle. But she never visited any of this kind of wide range of emotion on, on young Hamilton. No. Well, evidently she wasn't close to him when he was being, well, I mean, she didn't, it was after he was grown and become a lawyer and was in the office and uh, uh, I think that's when their relations, as I say, I think their relationship started about the time that, that she just transferred her affection and he was receptive. Because Margaret, his, his for instance, life, evidently, his home life wasn't any great shakes either. Young Hamilton? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Or because was his father, I don't know which wife he was living with, but he had several wives along the way. And, and I don't suppose that Hamilton Jr. had too um, happy a childhood. No. I gather that. Um, what about Helen's relationship? with her brother, Hamilton the Elder. Well, they got along in a fighting, quarreling sort of way. I think she liked, the, they had an affection for each other, but they were, they were constantly uh, arguing about something. And she'd call on the telephone and they were going to have a conversation that never ended up in anything but a screaming, hanging up situation. Did, he didn't disagree with her politically. I know that. Oh, he I her. doubt that. I'm sure that he supported her uh, in, in her politics and probably other things. He did, I know, give her a great money. deal of support at times. I don't know about and, money. Uh, money. For okay. instance, I can understand the differences that she had with Jean because Jean's mind. Yeah. Jean doesn't have any fine minds. She's just yeah. a good person. But intellectually, she's <laughs> she's just not on a par with Helen you know, at all. Mm. Didn't uh, I think she may have run from the kind of interests that Helen had? Maybe because she wanted to do the opposite of whatever Helen did. But I also think it was basically that she didn't have to grasp the thing. But uh, so that's why I wonder about Hamilton, her brother, who apparently was. Um, I never saw the two of them together. 
they never had, there was never, uh, other than Christmas Eve, when they all gathered at Gene's house, and uh, Hamilton Sr. would read the Christmas story. I don't think they ever got together socially. I, I, maybe uh, during the times when I was in the office, uh, occasionally, Guy and Helen would go to the Smiths for dinner, and dinner was at 6 o'clock, and whenever 6 o'clock came, uh, Dr. Smith went to the dining room table, and if you weren't ready to eat, that was just too bad. <laughs> And uh, uh, but I don't remember, or and I saw so much of her. Uh, and, but I like you would think on the days that uh, families get together, they would be together. But as I say, they did Thanksgiving with me, and I did Christmas Day with them for years. So there was no family getting together except in that hour or so, however long they could spend each other on Christmas Eve <laughs> at the Smith house, they got together. Well, and of course, when uh, Hamilton uh, Sr. died, and Junior, well, he and I... Hamilton Sr. Uh, died after Hamilton Sr. Yeah. Uh, I think he died in 57. Yes, I, uh, I'm sure that's true. And I went to that funeral. Ham was there, and he says, "I hope this isn't going to get where we only see each other at funerals." So. Uh, Hamilton the elder. Oh, well, this was because I I always had a a uh, cocktail party there on Saturday before Christmas. hadn't had such an integrity, and if I hadn't had such an integrity, we would have probably had a big affair, you know, and I think Helen would have been all in favor of it, <laughs> but of course we didn't. Now you're speaking about Junior. Yes, because uh, I gather I he was a really fun. a fine young man, and uh, also a fun-loving. Yes, we had lots of fun, uh, and saw each other quite often, in, not in the uh, other than at a business, or maybe for lunch, or at, a, at their home, or our home. Were you divorced, by the way? No. Well, I was not divorced in the 60s, so I was still married during all this period. Um, but I don't know when I started telling you. <laughs> I'm sure I haven't told you anything. So no, no, no. You're doing just that, exactly yeah. what I'd like you to do, to talk. Um, but I've forgotten the question again. I get off on the Yes, I've forgotten it as well. Um, oh, you know, whether she and, and Hamilton Sr. go along, as I right, yes, something about their relationship, as I say. I think that probably, unless she went up to his office and was in the neighborhood of the uh, Candler building and just happened to go up there for some reason, and uh, I don't think they had any, uh, any relationship at all. An argument on the telephone upon occasion at Christmas Eve. <coughs> She uh, started as a lawyer in the, in the family firm, her father and her father, but left them yeah, well, not very long yeah, afterwards and set up her own office. There's, I have no explanation of why she did that, but well, I could well was, have been. I think all of those Douglases were uh, so, uh, they were such individuals and all so hard-headed. There was just no way for them to get along on a daily basis. You know, you have to, living with somebody or being in an office with someone on a daily basis, you have to really be able to get along with them. Um, now, Nancy, whether it was Nancy Downing or says that Dr. Randolph Smith, Jean's husband, uh, and Helen did not get along at all. As I told you the story about uh, Dr. Uh, Randolph throwing her out of the house, yeah. this is the story Jean's told me. Helen beating the door down. <laughs> Coming back and she had to tell what she had to say, no doubt. <laughs> and oh. uh, also young young Douglas Jean's son, the doctor, uh, tells me that uh, that Jean and Helen would scream across the lake at each other. <laughs> That's possible. 
Jean, of course, was a great uh, was a great bridge player. I, she didn't dance in those days, Nancy tells me, because Dr. Smith uh, didn't approve of it. He also insisted that Jean wear these great heavy uh, orthopedic shoes. He was an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and so, in, in, in effect, uh, Jean really couldn't do this thing that interested her, but as soon as he died, she began to And Nancy tells me that Jean has often said in the intervening years, oh, what would Dr. Uh, Dr. Bill Smith think about my doing this? <laughs> Nancy says that she comforts her, has comforted her with the notion that he'd be happy with whatever made you happy. And she, you know, she does seem to lead a life that she finds exciting and fulfilling, even at her age. And um, she seems I like got a mental picture of Helen. Her sister was well, spending all I, this money I look, at Arthur Murray. I look oh. at uh, the pictures which Jean That's has on her tables of herself in these gorgeous billowy gowns, gray hair. She never did anything to her hair, but it's beautifully coiffed. But in the arms, here she is, this gray coiffed, but lovely matron, dancing in the arms of what looks like a 20-year-old. <laughs> but beautiful, you know. She uh, apparently is very skillful at it. As I said, she's won many prizes. <coughs> well, Helen is, is, is to me upon occasion, speaking of beauty, she says, you know, Amber, I was a beautiful young girl. Have you seen the pictures? of her when she was a young girl. There were many, for instance, that accompanied this series that ran in the newspapers of their trip west. They were good-looking young women. So. Um, Jean especially. Helen was, was good-looking, but there's a quality, uh, sort of a pixie look to her face, and her yeah. teeth were never that good. Jean's were better. Yeah. And so that her beauty is not quite up to Jean's, mm. but she was a good-looking mm. And she'd look at herself, you know, and she got so I'm sure that she had enough to age her 20 years there in that year of time, year of time, you know, uh, that she could say. And I remember her several times, either at her home or maybe at the home. You know, I used to be a beautiful girl. <laughs> Look well, at me now! Did she really feel that she'd become old and, and uh, well, I think unpretty? She, I think she knew that she had done it great deal of aging in that period. And, um, well, there's no doubt. I don't think uh, that beauty made a whole lot of difference to Helen. As I say, we had to, I had to shove her out to make her go over the riches or up to Helen's or somewhere to get some new clothes. And we do this maybe once a year and get her a whole three or several outfits. You, know, you feel in a way that you kind of mothered her, perhaps? In some ways. That, I, that she didn't think mattered, and I thought she could do better. Did she have any, in this particular period, did she have any other close women friends? No, I, th I don't think so. You and, and she really had an affinity. And that, uh, that uh, we knew them and we were with them so much. Several times a summer we'd go down to the lake on the weekend. Many times when Guy was out of town, I'd just go down and spend the night with her. And um, I saw my first television in the because, you know, I couldn't see anything, but it was there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. But there was never anyone else there. That's the point I was making. So there was one couple, the name I cannot remember, younger man, he and his wife, and he was um, uh, the Southern or Regional or some kind of a representative for the FSS or something. What's that? That's, like, that's one of these patent medicine folks. Oh. FSS, Swift, Stephanotic, Specific, or something like that. And they left Atlanta and moved to Illinois or somewhere. But that's the only couple that... Uh, Speaking of her uh, lack of interest in, in clothes, this Dr. Ted Smith here in Minneapolis. Um, Are you going to talk to him? 
No, not really, because when I was down there, um, oh, you saw him there. I didn't see him, but he called me. Oh. Um, apparently, the only he wanted to tell me something about her, and I gathered from what, what he later said in that same conversation that that's about all we knew of it. Um, uh, he uh, apparently was in San Francisco at the time, and he said he wanted to tell me about the time that, that she came out there with a uh, uh, some, some legal and way. <laughs> Yes, uh, and she, and yeah, she had a pair of pajamas and a toothbrush and a bottle of whiskey, and uh, she'd uh, said that if she needed any other clothes, uh, there was some kind of an occasion in which he said that he thought she was going to need something. She says, well, if I do, I'll go to Sears Roebuck and buy, <laughs> buy something. <laughs> I later, uh, when I was in Atlanta this time, I also talked to someone whom you may have known. Uh, the hairdresser Michelle. Yes. Whose last name I have, but it's not here. Um, I have a tape of it, um, in which he described the same kind of thing. Apparently, this was a habit of hers to travel with a uh, pair of pajamas, a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and well, and I don't remember the whiskey part because she was certainly not a drinker. He he told me also about the white gloves. Take this, you were yeah, about to say. It was either a dark blue or a black suit, and the white blouse that one of the this was you know, after the the wash and wear thing had just come in on the market, and she was washing rinse and wash out her blouse and her hose and her undergarments. I suppose uh, she traveled alone, and she does travel very nice. Take any extra clothes. Whenever she went. To. I remember that. She made a trip after I was newer to California and Mexico because she brought me some earrings from Mexico. I don't remember the occasion for it or why she went. She went by herself on that trip. And she and Guy went to Mexico on a couple of trips, uh, just vacation yeah, trips. You could have. And, uh, but the travel light she did, I guess. Do you know anything about her uh, trip to uh, to Israel? I talked to a oh, Dr. Mrs. Janice. That must have been a caution for the day <laughs> Because she got dysentery at some point shortly after landing, wherever she landed, and was in Israel in the hospital. She broke her ankle in Cairo. And, uh, well, that was after she, her, she initially terrible diarrhea. And of course at the top of her lungs, demanding things all over the place. Was she with Guy on this trip? No, she was. Uh, they told me, the janitor well, said she along. was alone. He was not along. It was a group of some kind that went in from Atlanta. She wasn't, she was, it, it was in connection with some group that was going to Israel. Israel and they had to, I don't know if they had to be booked as if they were going somewhere else. It was in the years, I think, when you couldn't get through some of these states right, to get to go to Israel. Anyhow, she ended up and spent all this time in the hospital. Then she had slipped. And uh, maybe where she got some of that money, I think she made a pretty good settlement at Eastern Airlines. <laughs> because it was at the airport that she left or slipped or whatever happened. Sure that she must have gotten something uh, out of that injury. The, the Janice has there. said that she went as uh, part of a group that was sponsored by the American Christian Palestine yeah, Association. I think something like that. Yeah. That she'd become interested in Israel and that they'd been very happy to have her interested in Israel, at least the pro Israel group in Atlanta, because she was a good propagandist for the cause of Israel. Then. Which she did do, apparently, uh, and I'm sure it was her own But that will. was the, uh, uh, how much of that trip, I don't remember how long they were gone, but I think she spent most of it in the hospital. <laughs> she was not with God. But, okay. oh, yeah, but I, it seems to me, I do recall, she finally did get to Jerusalem. Maybe the, whether this was before or after the accident, I don't know. You, and, you, and, and, the business of looking at where the Christ was supposed to be buried, or the or Ruth, uh, uh, where the whale was, or Sarah, or whoever that was, really couldn't care less. Helen. Yeah. yeah. 
she was interested in what Israelis were doing in Israel, but as far as the religious part, the religious part of it was concerned, the fact that all the shrines were there, I'm sure uh, she went reluctantly as she went at all. You spoke about Margaret Hills Fairley. Margaret Hills, who later became Margaret Fairley. Hills Fairley, right. is that it? Uh, when Helen knew her, would she have been Margaret Hills? Hills. And she later married. Right. You spoke in a letter that you wrote um, that, and you've also just said that, that she represented Helen in the matter, uh, the matter of trying to get the ballots which were, the, incidentally, were the write-in ballots in the general election, which were sealed, and she never was given access to. They refused her access to them. She felt that these, uh, an examination of these ballots would show how many had been cast for her, right. not counted, right. and all, undoubtedly they would have, but they made a big point of, of uh, refusing and securing them. Uh, as Davis said, with Helen, he wrote this in one of his letters, with Helen Lankin, we've got to be very legal stick to the law. <laughs> Don't do anything that she can catch us on. That's, that's his phrase. Um, and I hadn't been, I had been thinking that it was a, that she sought to get them in the state court, but obviously it was a federal court. What was the cause of her break with Margaret Hill? You, you wrote well, about not really break, but uh, Margaret was very, uh, was an admirer of Helen. happy to help her in this situation and was instrumental in my going upstairs to talk to her. But she, uh, uh, again, she wasn't willing, Helen was never willing to take advice very well. Well, there's nothing a lawyer dislikes more than somebody who won't take their advice and follow it right now. Oh, everybody says this is You know, and whether, whether she blamed Margaret for something that happened in that I don't know, but it was uh, uh, some two or three years later. Uh, this was after I was out of the office and all. And Margaret was being uh, uh, going in as president of the Association of Women Lawyers and had asked Helen. She had some spot on the program. I don't remember just what it was. And was, of course, sitting at the head table, or maybe she was just sitting at the head table. I don't remember what part she had, but anyhow, she got there. We got there, and she discovered that Davis was there. Jim. Jim Davis was there and was going to be at the head And we knew. I mean, she just showered down on Margaret. I, out of my presence, I didn't hear the conversation. And she wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And then you come in, and all that, how you girls, you know, this you. Margaret, the whole group of lawyers, how you girls could do this to me, you know. Well, nobody was trying to do anything to her, but she took everything so personally in relation to that word. But he was just there because he was Congress. He was invited to come, and he came, naturally. But she finally, I don't know what all had, but uh, Margaret sort of backed off from her after that, that incident. She couldn't believe Helen take on this way about the situation. Did people come to think that Helen was a bit crazy? I don't think they thought she was crazy. I think they thought she was, I mean, people, uh, you crazy know, life bad. goes on, and she just wouldn't let go of that situation until uh, people would just sort of want to be away from her because they didn't want to hear it anymore. And there was nothing they could do. There was no other thing they could do. And Incidentally, young guy tells me that uh, that he left. You know, he'd come back to Atlanta after the war, and it would have, he helped her in the campaign in '46. That's possible. And then, of course, on the general election in November, she saw what had happened to her. She, as you say, didn't let go and didn't mm -hmm. for some several years after that young guy says that she was so wrapped up in herself that there was absolutely nothing that could be said to her about anything outside of this thing that happened to her and the way that she was fighting back. And that he felt so left out of it and so completely <laughs> uh, out of her 
uh, you know, out of her thoughts. Perhaps there was a bit of jealousy involved, and kind of like, look at me, I'm home from the war. But in any case, he felt that he just couldn't be there any longer, and that was why he went north to New Jersey and attempted to find well, a new career for himself. Sure it's young Sue Douglas, by the way, had known Elizabeth. Did you know this story? No. Uh, the girl whom he, yeah. when he went north, Sue uh, uh, said, oh, I've got a friend up there. They'd been in the Red Cross together, Sue and Elizabeth, in Europe. And uh, Sue said, I want you to meet her. And so apparently uh, the young guy met her right away, and very shortly they decided they would get married. And this was the origin. <laughs> All of this of course, came at a moment in Helen's life uh, when, when, when it was the worst moment right. for this kind of thing to happen, the worst moment to expect her to use any kind of she intelligence. She probably didn't him. want him to go in the first place. Yeah. And then when he went up there, it was that. Well, Sue tells me that uh, Helen, in turn, turned against her for a long time Possibly and held she her responsible. That she, was if she could find someone to hold responsible for something that happened. She really did. Although Sue uh, feels that she was very close to Helen, and uh, that Helen was very close to her. And she told me many touching stories about um, Helen's devotion to young God. So, as you confirm, um, the feeling between the two of them was, and as young guy himself has said, we were so very close. This is an exact quote. To have had this, this break that was so complete was, was perhaps all the sharper because of that. A young guy apparently worked very closely with her in all of her campaigns for the legislature. Did you ever know um, Everett Milliken? Yes. The relationship... She felt like he had let her down, too, in the end. Do you know anything about this? I mean, why she felt this? Well, I think what Helen would have done was run for the state senate. Oh, was there talk I believe retired, and this always they had kept from her. And by the time she knew of it, it was sort of over. I think she had a sort of a. This was after '48. Yeah, I think she had a sort of a understanding. She and Milliken were good friends. Very close, and I've I seen him several times. I believe that he had, uh, at some point in time, told her that if he ever decided not to run, he would let her know when she could, you know, that they would sort of do this, uh, you know, as friends, and then he did make that You think he told her this when they were in the Helen. legislature together or before the Congress episode or after? It may have been during, it may have been at the beginning of the problem, you know. Or it just before it just consumed her. Anyhow, that was all done and over with before she even knew about it. And she just felt like he had gone back on his word to her. Do you she think then that she might have run for the state senate after the yeah, Congress? If, if that situation had Did she break with Everett after that? Well, he, like so many other of her former supporters and, and friends just stayed away from her because uh, they they didn't want to be showered down on anymore about what had happened to her. She would just sort of corner you and just go over it, through it, over it, trying to find some place that something else could have been done or get an agreement with them or I don't know. I have had two long talks with Everett and he's very seriously ill. He's had yeah, I was wondering if what what his remembrance would be or well, what his Well, he has some is. of the fondest memories of her. Of oh, they, I think that they um, were very friendly. He speaks of her he as his best even, friend. And I don't think he not even realize that she was hurt in that situation. I think but that I he probably doesn't. Uh, he didn't. I didn't know anything. He was in I, a political situation where he probably felt that he couldn't help himself. He had to do what he did. The only thing that brought. Uh, that made me think that there had been something that <laughs> that occurred between them that wasn't good because the two interviews I had with him, he spoke only of her in the most. Well, he was not yeah. going to uh, say anything that would uh, discredit him in any way. Well, this really wouldn't have been to discredit him. 
I, I found in the Davis correspondence um, a letter that Bill Eden, who was Davis's office manager, legislative assistant, I think he was called, uh, when he came back to Atlanta to arrange for the 48th campaign, which was the one following the bitter one with Helen. Yeah. Uh, Helen, by that time, had been, I had found that the Congress wouldn't unseat Davis and was going on it. And Bill Eden, coming back in January of 48 to set up the uh, election machinery for the primary, apparently went to Milliken and asked him to use his influence to persuade Helen not to run that time. Uh, this is what Bill wrote to Jim Davis. And Eden then quotes Milliken as saying, Helen has gone a little bit crazy. I can't do anything with her anymore. The implication of it was that he would have tried to talk her out of it, but he didn't really have anything to do with her anymore. Well, because you couldn't get near her. Anyone that she had been close to in, in that political sense, and her former supporters. As I say, they just weren't going to expose themselves to that, to that did uh, did, did Helen about. then break with Everett? Did she not uh, have any close relationships with him in the last years of her life? Well, I think she was terribly disappointed in whatever this was, whatever this deal was that they had, and that, that he evidently felt uh, was no longer uh, a deal after everything she went through. But there had been no reason to have that deal in the first place hadn't been made at the time maybe she didn't run for the legislature and got into this congressional thing that he would let her know that she would she would have first refusal of running for his seat if something happened to this congressional and I think if she put that to him he'd get that story. He's not telling you that for some reason. And he didn't let her know. Or maybe he felt that she wasn't at that point capable about it. He may have felt like he didn't want her to go through another uh, fall. I don't know, but I know that she was he terribly well disappointed. That, that she not lived and it would not anything. have made any difference. Uh, there had been no way that he could have explained that to her. You know. He may have felt uh, any number of things, but one of them could have been that she outlived her political right. life. That could have been she it. really couldn't be elected. But even, even then, she would have felt like he should have told her and let her make that decision. I mean, that was the thing. Uh, Everett Milliken, of course, was not a and racist, but I think, I think that Everett Milliken was not in the vanguard of those uh, seeking right. to bring the Negro into right. the mainstream of political life. He but wasn't he, in the mainstream, but he nevertheless was one of the two who voted against the school closures in 50, uh, 56, whenever that came. Who was it who attempted to close the schools rather than to integrate them? Oh no, I don't think he was uh, racist in any way. But he was, he was just there. He was with the Gulf Oil Company. You know, they're all very outstanding gentlemen. Oh indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it had seemed uh, he he spoke of her and such things as oh he wished that she were alive today. Oh, they were very good friends. And but he hurt her terribly by not. Uh, I mean, I, I can remember some conversations, and the feeling I get is that, uh, well, even if you felt that way, you should have told me because you said you would, and I may not have run, you know, this sort of thing, but she felt like you owed her. You can't put a date on any of these. Well, this would have been after the, uh, would have been at what time that he not run for the legislature? Uh, I don't have that before. That would have been when it happened. Now, as to what they, their agreement that she considered... Uh, he went fine. away to Texas for three years, but I don't know what the was from. Well, that must have been during that, that time, because it was at the time that all of a sudden, it was here, you know, that American not running, and somebody else has someone's got it in the bag, and she's not. Tom Camp, as I said, talked on at great length as though all of these events seemed to have total recall. Uh, 
Um, well, of course, they were all in, personally involved in it. Well, I was involved as a vice friend, a bystander, sort of. Well, but not everybody's had that kind of recall. <laughs> Your recall is not, the, you know, any worse than most of us. Tom's is considerably better. So that when he got to this point, he was talking about... Um, I spoke about Helen's having gone to Washington in the early 40s to testify on behalf of the black, which she did in the creation of the song. She was a great... Uh, uh, her, her service in, in France, and she'd been head of the Overseas Service League, and uh, she was sort of gung-ho about the military, I think. Um, especially during the war. Tom then sort of said, I could tell you a story about what she tried to get done in Washington for herself. I think I'm paraphrasing that that's what he did. And then he said, no, I won't tell you that. I better not. I only heard it second or third hand. And he, he referred to it again briefly, and so I attempted to draw him out and to say, okay, I won't use it. But he never would tell me. Um, so I'm sure it wasn't that he didn't recall it, in fact, he acknowledged that he knew what he was saying, but he didn't want to tell me because he didn't know it was true. Have you any notion of what he could have been referring to? My hunch is that it's... No, um, because in my, my experience, well, there was so little she tried to do for herself. My hunch is that she maybe tried to get herself a commission in the Women's Army Corps. Well, that's possible. Yeah. I don't know. That, that would be unre been, unre it wouldn't no. be unrealistic. Nor would it have been unreasonable. No. Uh, uh, in fact, she'd have been a damn good army yeah. officer, don't you think? Oh, Lord. <laughs> yes. No, well, she, it, she certainly never mentioned that to me. Of course, I, when I knew her, was well, after the war. Before. Right. Oh. Uh, What do you know about the eye operations that she had? Young George Stoney, well, he was young then, who was her campaign manager in July of 46, that campaign, um, said that sometime just before the 17th day of the election, like a few days before, they were in the middle of the campaign and she disappeared back into the office with a huge bandage over her eye. And she would never tell them uh, what it, what she'd have done. She for how long? <laughs> well, a few days. Well, she had an um, eye, a cataract operation. But that apparently was not a cataract at that time. She didn't want anyone to know at that time about the eye operation because it would have had some effect on the election, she thought. You know, someone disabled, and, you know, she's... Uh, well, but I know that later on she did have cataract, cataract operations. Operation. Was it two cataracts or was it one? That was in the days when they kept you uh, quiet and sandbagged you and you couldn't move your head and all this stuff, you know. And she, uh, it must have, they never do both, they didn't do both eyes at the same time. I don't know. And she so never could get used to those thin glasses. Had she, did she never. eventually have both eyes done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that must have had both eyes done, but I don't. Dr. Hallam did it, I know that. Oh, that's. You know his first name? Hallam. in the uh, medical arts building. Helen and uh, something, he was, he's probably gone by now, but he was, he was older than that, Helen. But they probably still have the records there. I don't think doctors have to do the records either. What was the name of the hospital? Oh, uh, his office was in the medical arts building. Helen, Helen. The only Hallam that was in that business. H A L L A M? Hallam. I went to him myself, and I remember his um, 
first night. I was trying to think of the, what they were, I think of the three, you know, something, something. The eye operations, were they the only physical problem that she ever had in the far last years that you knew? Far as I know. But she, her health was generally very good, wasn't Her it? health was generally good. She had this chronic bronchitis thing, you know, I'm cigarettes sorry. she used try to stay away from them way out here. Did she ever give up smoking? Never? No. Did she continue to use that cigarette holder she until always, the end? She always, and I never saw her with a cigarette that she didn't have in the holder. And Did she would light one out the She looked like you know. uh, Franklin Roosevelt with a jelly jaw. She had several, I gave her several, three year old. She had all kinds of things. But she, um, as I said, Tom... Never, I never saw her with a cigarette that wasn't in the holder, except maybe when she'd take that little snub that was left out and light another one. She just let one off the other constantly. She smoked from it. She died of lung cancer or she had I don't know. She was pretty strong. Her um, sister, Jean, who smoked like that, three packs a day, about 12 years ago, was told she better give them up. And her husband said, yes, you better give them up, and she did. Had a smoke cigarette since. So they were strong women. Yeah. <laughs> they were, you know, oh, there was... If she'd ever decided to do it, I'm sure there'd been no problem. Right. Oh, I don't know. I don't recall. It may have been uh, now and then when she tried not to smoke for a day or something. I don't know, but it didn't last long if she did. Uh, she called. You know, she had this chronic... I assume it was chronic bronchitis. Have that gadget, the bulb on that you're spraying her throat. <laughs> and uh, did you ever go to any baseball games with her? Once or twice. I knew nothing about baseball, and I remember she took me out. We went out to uh, to that Ponce Leon baseball park and uh, watching the game. She was very, you know, very interested in baseball, and was a very good friend of. Uh, Earl Mann. Earl Mann. She was a scout. I, I never knew if that was... Haven't well, yet, I, think I haven't she, seen Earl Mann. Uh, well, I think she... Uh, it was kind uh, of a publicity uh, gimmick on his part, or was it... No, I guess she was really serious about baseball. But I think she observed. She, When she would go to the game, she would observe, and she would discuss with him players and what she thought somebody might be doing or not doing, or that there's a player on the other team that they should try to get or something. I think she did some of that. But we went anyhow. She had a gold pass. And uh, we were we watched the game. And when it was time for the seven-minute stretch, I was going up the steps. I was ready to leave. <laughs> she got the biggest charge out of that that I didn't know enough about baseball to know what a seven-minute stretch was. Apparently, she took Nancy Downing to a game. And Nancy had the same feeling about baseball that you did. Well, Nancy then spoke I about what a beautiful ballet the, the team was performing, and this, <laughs> Ellen never took her again. <laughs> Did you know Nancy? Yes. Uh, I uh, met Nancy, of course, through Helen, and the last contact I had with her was when she redid my apartment back in a good person. I felt, uh, I was trying to think of her friend's name. Alice. Alice. Are they still living me. together? Well, she lives with someone named Alice. Yeah. Yes. I think it Which brings me to another point. You know, people have said, in and my talk, to make the best Christmas, used to make the best uh, Christmas plum puddings. And I'd find a plum pudding on my door. That happened for well, maybe two or three years after Helen was gone, and then we just had to put back, you know. Nancy is not well. Up. She has Parkinson's. No, she didn't seem too well back when I knew her. She was, didn't, didn't seem very strong. Helen used to try to uh, run her life, too, you know. <laughs> but there were times when you just had to come home to her, because uh, there she was, just like the Rock of Gibraltar, when you yeah. were in trouble. She was... 100% right in there with you. Even when I see Nancy 
I've seen her several times, and she both times, she, you know, she remembers, she, she cries, she mm -hmm. the, the mere talking of her. <laughs> it's, it's incredible the kind of uh, effect that she had on people. For my own part, people say to me, why are you interested in doing this story? And it's what I've told you, basically, but um, I've never been able to understand why I had the affection for her. I didn't know her as well as you did. Um, but I remember seeing her the first time in the state legislature. I was a young, very young, and on my first job. And they sent me pretty early to the state legislature to come. And of course, there's Helen sitting in her walk by hat. And it was kind of like an attraction that um, was no explanation. And, uh, uh, and in those days, and I talked to Milliken about this because he was in the legislature with me. Mm -hmm. He talked her into running for the legislature, too, in the beginning of the campaign with her. But she was kind of an object of ridicule. And I... Oh, and in this, you know... Yeah. They, she was, as Everett says, she was smarter than most of them. Yeah. She had more influence than any other woman who had served before or since, although yeah. I guess Grace Hamilton has certainly exceeded that by now. Um, she worked harder than most of them, and, and as, as Everett says, she could outthink most of them. Speaking of her intellectual ability, of course, the intellectual ability in the Georgia legislature was none too high. <laughs> it's a fact. But, but she'd go straight to a. She could see a problem and go straight to the solution. Well, she didn't know why she was going to get there, but she knew what it was supposed to be. I had a long talk with Ellis Arnold, and he had great respect for her, too. He said I, she had something that she wanted me to do. He said she. I wound up doing it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he, he admired it. But still, my colleagues on, on the newspaper, uh, there was a general tendency to kind of laugh behind their hand. Uh, oh, Helen Lankin, you know, and I didn't understand it, really, and perhaps to this day I still don't, although it's one of the things I've been trying to get answered. Um, George Stoney, for instance, says that that he thinks that she cultivated this, that she was willing for people to laugh at her because it, uh, she got their attention and uh, uh, it made her stand out in their minds. In a way. I don't know, this is sort of an inadequate explanation, but she, that she did not attempt to, <laughs> to fight the ridicule that she uh, aroused in people. She was, of course, unique in her day. There were very few women. In oh, she was unique in any day. Well, her personality just made her that. But she, there was about her physically a thing which, in Georgia male, certainly of that period, she, you know, she thought like a man and she looked like a man. She cussed like a man. And there were there were people who thought she was a man, that she yeah, was a homosexual. She, that she shouldn't that she was certainly not a lady. Oh and god, she that would was be the right. first one if you suggest that she was, it would say that I'm no damn lady. Well, Everett Milliken, for instance, said, Oh, that was just a pose. She could be a lady. Whenever oh, she sure wanted to go to a could. party she could. But let me just ask you and, and uh, as I've said, several of these the people I talked to in Georgia, especially those who were not didn't agree with her politically and said, well, I don't know if she was a homosexual or not, uh, she, at least she was married. Do you... Well, hell, if she ever was, she didn't know it. I can't is, believe that. Is it something true. that if it, if she... Well, I'd say she was very upset because she thought Nancy Downing was, and I think she is too. Oh, and sure. Helen was of the school that that was just beyond the pale. Did Helen feel that... Uh, Never did she ever believe that Nancy was a lesbian? We discussed it once or twice. I mean, I think she, uh, I remember uh, she was rather, rather upset about that. She was like uh, so many people of her era would be that if it were true, she didn't really want to know it. You know. And this Ellen person who was married uh, and divorced. They were in Alice's ministry. Alice was married. They had a shop on it around 10th Street somewhere. 
whoever Nancy's living with now teaches school, so maybe it's not the same person. Probably, I don't know. Uh, they. Very tall. I doubt that she's ever been a teacher or a teacher. I think she spent 30 minutes in England once, and from then on she had a very bad accent. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I just think you can cut it with a knife. Just to go on. And, I uh, think that Nancy has spoken of her. And I can't remember her name. Maybe it's Alice, whoever she lives with. Maybe she gave her the name Alice. I don't know. Um, you didn't meet this person. I, I did. Yeah. She came in the last she time was I was there in July. She had, well, she had black hair back in those days. Well, I don't think it's but black they were hair. in, this person that I'm thinking of, they were, uh, had something to do with the business together. And of course, neither one of them were in the slightest way business oriented. You know, as far as keeping books or records or getting anything done on a promised day or anything like that, that was just the only, just one time Helen was wild and she would straighten them out and then go back out and get the same mess again. Nancy's business but has really, uh, come, it, it's fallen off. She's spoken in the times that I've seen her in the last year of uh, there being a depression. <laughs> Uh, in the interior decorating business. She, uh, but I know that Helen uh, mentioned this homosexuality thing to me once. And I had the impression, oh, I was about as naive about it all as she was in those days, that uh, she didn't really want to believe it. Or if it really were true, she still wasn't going to believe it. You know. So if she had that feeling about it, Certainly, she had none of it in herself, and where she would be aware of it. No, I don't think so. Well, uh, she was, she managed looking. She was a big woman. She uh, had this deep voice, and she was, as you say, swore like that trooper. And uh, I think she sort of felt like that was the only way that she could uh, make it and what she wanted to do. She sort of built that. I remember um, Natasha Davidson, who was uh, Harold Davidson, Dr. Harold Davidson's wife, who was a Russian. She came and met her husband during the uh, First World War over there in Europe somewhere, and Mary came over here with him. And uh, Helen was doing whether she was freelancing or what, anyhow, she was doing some of the writing and then came out to her and Natasha told me about her one time. And Natasha her, was doing the No, writing. Helen was doing the writing at the time, and interviewing Natasha, I suppose, about her background, the fact she was Russian and all this stuff after the war and so on. So like this would have been about the time she was doing all this traveling and the rest and writing. Yeah, and, right. so. and Natasha's about all she ever to say about she was the most beautiful girl, woman she had ever seen. So she must have been very ladylike and very beautiful and all and what were good. I didn't realize that Helen um, had done other writing. I know that she did uh, uh, publish the series about the cross USA tour. Yeah. And it was a copyrighted series. And she, in her biography, she said that she was the author of 13,000 Manless Miles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, but I don't believe that it was published in in any book form. Do you know anything about that? I don't think it was either. But it was for the Atlanta newspaper. Right, yes, yes. They were the one who published it. And evidently, every now and then, she actually. would do some other writing. Because I know Natasha said that she came out to interview her for a story for the paper. Right. The, the Atlanta Georgian uh, had published this series, mm -hmm. and actually that's the way they paid for the trip, you know, Helen yeah. filed dispatches back, mm -hmm. and they became known as the Douglas Girls, and they had national publicity, but it was a great deal of national publicity. Um, it, was, it was that unique at the time. She 
apparently the story she's told the story and it's in these these clippings um, from the journal of the constitution that she sold the article an article about the cross usa tour to motor magazine and got forty dollars for it and that was what she used to set up her office after she she left her father's brother's firm and used this forty dollars <laughs> Buy a desk and then with forty dollars you could buy an awful oh, lot. Yeah. Um, could it have been for the Georgian that she was? Well, I would assume it was for a local paper. Um, Whether it ever, well, I would also assume that they sent her to do it. It wouldn't be something she would have just done on her own, or maybe she did and wrote it up and whether she sold it, I don't know. I'm having a hard time finding these old Georgians who are going to Washington. Um, the Library of Congress has the Constitution and the Journal Act 1860, but not the Georgian. And oh, I really? think that there, I mean, this kind of thing I might have found in the Georgian mm -hmm. without your telling me about it. Now that I know of it, I may have to go back to Atlanta again, which I was hoping not to do. I wrote to the Red Cross a few weeks ago to ask them about Helen's claim that she had originated the role with this little Red Cross button and, uh, and the roll call drive. You know that Helen did make this claim in, in the campaign literature. This, for instance, is about the way it was used in her campaign literature. This is from the Rockford College alumni in 1946. When she was a senior, she conceived of the idea of the Red Cross button and instituted the first citywide Red Cross drive. And in the literature, she said, it then became national evolved into the National Road Well, the Red Cross wrote to me. Denying it all. I denying suppose. it all. Uh, Meyer Mapp is Director, Office of Systems Analysis Information. Well, uh, uh, and we go through a place called Candia, which is just a little spot of the road in Minnesota. That's where the first uh, Scandinavian settled here. Because it reminded them of that. Film. I don't know the name of it, but it's apparently about the early Scandinavian uh, immigrants. Maybe I think it's called the immigrants. Rovall wrote that, but it's three books. The immigrants, something about them, the immigrants, his parents were some of his grandparents or somewhere along the way, some of those first settlers. And when he became the governor of Minnesota, I mean, they came along, you know. I have read the immigrants. That's one of those things I've been meaning to do. But anyhow, did you not feel in Georgia? Um, the difference, of course, the a relatively liberal kind of social attitude that you've grown up with here in this part of the country. Uh, in the South, this didn't, this, this didn't, as you say, you were not politically inclined in those days, uh, but but the, the environment that, that uh, you came from and went to, you didn't feel any, any difference really, did you? Well, I felt like the, uh, People in Atlanta took me in and were very friendly. I had a great life in Atlanta. And um, I don't know, uh, I don't know how I did it. You know, it just happened. Well, I guess by the, when you left here, you were not, uh, not politically aware. Well, I, as I say, that the, 
the senior partner in the law firm said if you ever decide to be serious about life you want to really have a career or do something, he'd recommend it. I said, well, so uh, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't even vote with him until after I'd been down there. <laughs> did you, uh, but did I you go to college? No, I just went to visit my law I mean, I didn't have any... I just discovered after I was there that these night schools, you didn't have to have the pre-law education and all that sort of thing. And, and so I thought, well, why not give it a shot? So I did, and it seemed to me, I guess he knew what he was talking about. Was, your, was Hamilton Douglas your teacher, I suppose? He was, uh, I think he taught one class, or maybe two. Uh, it seems to me that he taught uh, contract. And I was trying to say domestic relations, but I'm not certain whether he had a thing or not. But uh, this was before I knew him. Had, you had heard of her in, in your work at the school, I suppose you heard of her there. I don't recall ever hearing her there. Uh, she, she apparently did. Not until I got into the women lawyers. Thing yeah. that I the years that she taught there, I haven't been able to pin those down. Although Ezra Phillips, who was on her uh, campaign election committee, you know, yeah. he was in the 5th District Congressional Election Committee. Uh, and then she put him on what Matthew calls her rump committee. I think he became the chairman. He said that she was his teacher. I don't know how, I know she uh, taught there. She did not teach there while I was there. But I think she did some uh, in the early years. Uh, and I don't know just when, but uh, I, the only incident that I recall telling me about that was uh, some of the students, male students particularly, and I believe she was teaching the domestic relations. And one of them made some comment or asked her some question that was designed to be uh, embarrassing. And uh, she just looked at him and said, young man, uh, my mother always told me never to answer a damn fool question. <laughs> Did, did Helen ever talk to you about her mother? Apparently her mother was, she was very fond of her mother. I mean, and her mother was a remarkable woman. Any, uh, any conversation about her was always in a sort of a, a very subdued tone and uh, like she sort of held her in awe, you know. Nancy and her father me. she uh, tells about, uh, she went evidently made many trips with her father. He would take her with him. Uh, well, I remember when he would like go to Washington. I don't know whether she ever went with him to Scotland. I think she did. Because he would go back uh, evidently quite often or made several trips back. And uh, uh, she was a member of the Burns Society. You know, and uh, told about one trip first time that she was, went to Washington, I think she would have locked herself in the, in the, in the uh, restroom on the train. Or uh, they, oh, she was accident? in the restroom uh, at the time they stopped in the station when all the, tra when all of the uh, restrooms were locked. Maybe that's the way, anyhow, she couldn't get out of there. And she was on the top of her voice. And that place, you can be sure, I think, called up where there was a transom. I don't remember. It's just one of those funny things that I can't remember. It was her first experience on the train. Um, I, I guess that machine went off when I was mentioning this to you. You never heard anything about her. She never talked to you about the Red Cross button. No. Red Cross, so you know not well, they really kind of meant no words. 
Well, it's very highly possible that she had was there and had something to do with that. Well, do they tell you who did think of it? Uh, both the annual membership fee of one dollar and buttons date back to 1901. Citywide membership drives were held in 21 cities in 1916. Well, it's possible that she. Is. The first annual membership drive was held in December 1917. Uh, it's the year 1917, in the spring of 1917, that she says the first one in Rockport, actually, where she was in college. She claims that she's used her own money to design and make a sample button, which was then so successful in being sold that numbers of communities around Rockford uh, picked up the idea. She was doing it for her in college. Um, was picked up on in Rockport, and this, uh, the story is, is uh, they don't send it to me here, but I have a couple of clippings from uh, Rockford paper that give her credit for it. Well, uh, I don't know if they're quoting her, and they don't seem to be in this story. Mm -hmm. So, as he says, we have been aware of Mrs. Mankin's claims and so on. She, he so says, where is this from? This is from the Red Cross. National office. National where office. Is the here. In Washington, um, dated December 6, 1977. The first annual membership drive was held in December 1917, but it was not called roll call until 1919. The use of the term was discontinued after the 1941 drive. Uh, President Roosevelt declared March Red Cross Month in 1943, and it has remained that ever since. The use of buttons was discontinued some years ago. And then he goes on about what it is today, of course, that's not true. Um, apparently, they had picked up on the claims. Well, it's possible. And they, in 19, March 5th, 1956, uh, they had their office do some research, origin of the Red Cross membership. What they find out? Our annual reports from 91 to 1998 show that Red Cross badges, also referred to as pins and buttons, were sold to the members. This is 56. Probably this guy is well, long before he was with As you say, who did develop it? Um, in 1908, the organization employed a national registrar to increase its membership. A campaign for a million members was launched, and celluloid pins and buttons purchased from Airma, E H R M A N, was were given for one dollar annual memberships, 1980. This practice of giving buttons has continued through the years. What year was that? 1980. Well, I was trying to think, maybe it's possible that uh, they didn't, maybe she, could she have helped organize a chapter in Rockford and introduce the button there? Could well be that Ellen originated this idea thinking it was original right. with her, right. and that it wasn't. I can't believe that she um, uh, would make that up. I can't. Uh, she apparently uh, had made the claim for the a long time. She and was driving the Red Cross ambulance in France. Well, Did it have a cross on it? No, she, she never said it wasn't a Red Cross ambulance. It was. Uh, she was with the uh, well, American Women's Hospital Unit yeah. that was attached to the French Army right. through right. the right. 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 Uh, American, uh, American United States Ambulance Service. Um, was it Red Cross? Uh, the American Red Cross briefly supported the latter, but in the autumn of 1917, both troops were disbanded, and it was run after that by the United States Army. The United States Ambulance Service had no connection with the American Red Cross. Did, uh, but there was an American Ambulance, American Red Cross Ambulance Service in Italy during 1980. They acknowledged that the situation about the ambulances is rather confused. In any case, Mrs. Mankin did not serve with the American Red Cross during World War One. She never claimed that. No. She said that she drove an ambulance. All right. Was well, this uh, this incident in Rockford before or after? Before. After she was in France? Or no, it was before. before. She graduated in uh, the spring of 1917 and um, then went home to Atlanta and started law school, but 
I was very keen about getting to France. We got into the war in, uh, in the spring of 1970, I think, and about the time she was graduating from college, she wasn't old enough to drive an ambulance, and this is how she came to falsify her age, <laughs> making herself older rather than younger. And uh, right. is there any way her passport says she was born in 1893, when in fact she was born in 1894. She went to work in Washington, and according to young guys, she actually falsified, got out of her records out of the State Department, uh, had access to them in some way, which he can't adequately explain to me, uh, falsified the original application, which apparently was made before she knew the age limit, and then was reaccepted. And uh, she went to France in October of 1918, so that she arrived just days before the armistice. But she stayed on for over a year, driving an ambulance in eastern France, where all of the devastation had been. And as you truly know, it was uh, devastation in the extreme, and there was a great deal of disease. And, uh, uh, so that the service was uh, a very valuable one, and not without considerable danger. Uh, there is some implication that she exaggerated this, but the most I've heard anyone say is that instead of transporting wounded soldiers, she worked with refugees, which is all right. Um, she wasn't exaggerating this claim. Well, that's possible, but uh, the first couple of runs were still while the war was on. Yes, well, she clearly did not, uh, did arrive. Uh, only not a day before the shooting right. stopped, but when you call it, the side had a citation from the French government. Right, she did. She was made an honorary citizen. She, along with other members of the same, you know, were made well, an honorary Well, I was going to ask you, have you talked to any other of those members? I haven't even talked to them. Well, there's only one that I know of who may not still be living, but she was the last time I met her. This is J. O. H. Sandery. So there were two of them from it. Were they the only two from Atlanta? I don't know, but I know that she was one. J O H Sandler. Those are initials. That's his name. Her husband's name. What was her first name? Oh, no, I don't really know because she was one of the two like the uh, socially involved and whenever you father would appear in the papers, for example, was always as good as J.O.A. Sanders, never her given name. And I can't remember what it was, but I'm sure I got it done. Helen apparently was uh, keen about the American Legion, and especially in those years just after the war in the Nancy speaks about the American Legion Convention that was held in Atlanta. Helen devised some special kind of... <laughs> a little bit risque entertainment in which she brought some of the girls from Nancy's school down to the center of the city to entertain these uh, guys away from home looking for young and pretty females. Um, well, there's the story about the Red Cross. <laughs> she, Ellen was very proud of this. And well, I would be uh, inclined to think that she may have introduced that into the chapter in Rock either not knowing that it had been done before, or, you know, everything that happened before one person has heard about it, they end up. That's for sure. They seem not to have picked up on it, I, I gather from this, that they didn't do much about it, but must have heard about it a number of times, um, so that by 1956 they thought they should do a little research on their own. And this uh, is dated. Um, 1956, this research, did you mention it? For over 20 years, we've been aware of her claim for over 20 years. So this uh, research that they originated with in 1956, that would have been over. That would have been a couple of years before she died. She died in, in July 56, so it was just a matter of months before she died. Um, I, I wonder <laughs> if she got, if she'd heard about their well, at any rate, there's no record of uh, her response. If I, you know, for 
my purposes and if you want to consider what she might have said. I swore that she died in 1958 because she was buried on my 40th birthday. July, July 25th, 1957. It, it was it was fifty six. I don't have the obituaries here. No, well, you certainly know what. I, mean, I I just I've got them. Home. I can. A guy called. Oh, wait I think he called and told Bruce about it between the time that I was called Bruce and told him that she had died. Uh, well, between the time I left the office and before I got home, as he told me when I got home, she had been in my office before 1.30 or 2 o'clock. We had had a little chat, and now we're looking for you Saturday. And, uh, Why had she been in town that day? Do you recall? Someone said there was a meeting. That's possible. I don't, I'm sure I didn't ask her what she was doing in town. You say she was in your office? She was in my office. And your office in the that was in the courthouse. And she left my office to go get her car to go home. And you were working with Webb? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I didn't go to work the next day, of course. You know, I, I didn't even show up about four or five days, I think. I spent most of that time with either at Smith's or with him. He made all the arrangements. I went with him to go get uh, Berlin Moore to do service. And we, uh, me and Nancy and I, scratched around and tried to get the music. Speaking like of that. that, Nancy told me that she had requested in oh, yeah. will, but the will, will doesn't, the, the will doesn't mention no, it. she'd always just said that. Anybody that's in hearing distance or any of the family that she wanted to impress on them that what she wanted sung at her funeral was get along real doggy now. She didn't say that. I guess some of the members of the family thought she did. Well, it wasn't the family, it was Nancy, and Nancy oh. has insisted this oh, on Nancy. several times I've seen it. Well, and uh, so I Nancy thought the will would say it, but it didn't. Well, Nancy probably thought that, or Kelly may have told her sometimes. Yeah. The thing is that Nancy told me this story, and it's some, uh, with some elaboration, one of the things she said was that that she had gotten one of the one of the things that enabled her to get through those days was the the uh, it's, it's your sister was it was the kind of laugh that she got from this request you know as though she'd not really heard it before um, hi Ellie <laughs> Mann is the woman's name who would have been one of those old women that she took care of and saw that got a decent burial. Was Allie Mann a teacher? I assume, I think she was. The other one that I was thinking of was the woman, that, that the name would be in the will, because it, uh, she gave me two sterling silver vegetable dishes that had belonged to this person. And she list, uh, designated them as having come from so-and-so. Lula Clements O'Brien is mentioned in the will. Yeah. But you're mentioned in the will too. Yeah. Mm. Well, I assume so because uh, Hamilton brought me these things that she had designated that I was to have. One was uh, two sterling silver vegetable dishes and uh, a ring and a, a topaz ring and pin. Yeah, I guess that was. I had um, But anyhow, she did. She. Uh, described or so that they would know what dishes she was speaking of, what bowl she was speaking of, as to who, where they had come from, who they had come from. You still have a ring? Uh, my niece, her daughter, has a ring. Yeah, I still have the pin which I had made into a ring. Um, do you know anything of the circumstances of Ali Mann's burial other than what you described no. to me? Something of the well, I mean, same thing. Yeah, she would have been one of the people that she arranged 
for the Patterson to take care of. Um, Nancy Downing describes, has described the help that she gave to a, a woman doctor. His name is also in my notes, but I think it's a Dr. Collins. Uh, this hairdresser, Michelle, spoke about the, the help that she'd given to one of the men who worked in the shop, a black man who had been arrested and uh, under circumstances where he probably wasn't very guilty, <laughs> and that she'd given him a good deal of help, gone down to the jail, gotten him out, as I uh, She did an awful lot of this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Adolf. Right, his last name is Michelle. Yeah, Adolf. And he's a Swiss. Mr. She always called him Mr. Adolf. And whenever she got her hair done, he too. <laughs> Which may not be too often. <laughs> but when she needed it, she could call he him says, and he'd take yes, care of it. He says that they had an even exchange. She did yes. his law service. He got, a hell, he got a hell of a lot more out of her than she got out of him. Well, what he said was that at the end of the year, Helen would bring him a bill. And uh, he would present her a bill, and whoever owed the other would pay. And he said that there was, on his part, never had the slightest qualm about accepting whatever she gave him. Of course, she didn't <laughs> quibble about his bill. He describes it as a as a situation of total and complete trust. And he, uh, the Rainey her. spoke to me. Did you know Glenn and Dorothy Rainey? Um, Glenn was very much involved in the political scene. What did uh, he, 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 taught, he taught at Georgia Tech, taught English. Oh. Dorothy was on the State Democratic Executive Committee in the headquarters of the, one of Ellis Arnold's appointees. Yeah. And she spoke for Helen on the radio in February 1946. She had a lovely speaking voice and uh, also was teaching, was a teacher, and uh, apparently uh, had a reputation of, as a speaker, also was very much. No, I didn't know her. Um, well, they, they told me that I ought to see Adolf this time. They arranged for me to see him. He remembers her with, you know, with, with such total warmth and affection, mm -hmm. as though she's still alive, like so many other people. Those who remember her well, <laughs> I can't say enough good, and those who remember her poorly are just about the same on the other side. Yeah. Well, as I say, you either did or you didn't. There's no in-between with Helen. You either liked her or you didn't. You kn did you know anyone who hated her? I mean, can you tell me anything about anyone in particular who, uh... Oh, that Jim Davis. <laughs> you got all of his body. Well, uh... No, I, but I remember this, that after I came back to work, after she was married and all, and there were, well, people around the courthouse uh, knew that our relationship, I suppose, with, uh, There with tears running down his face, and I just about that moment. And that's the way he either felt that way about her, or he had no feeling at all, or else it was just what? Don't remember his name. Did you know Horace Moore, who became yeah. a legislative yeah. secretary in Washington? Yeah. When he came back, okay. I haven't been able to find him. Well, he's uh, working in Decatur. Yeah, he was a court reporter for one of the judges over there. I thought he, he was retired a in Fulton County and went over there. And he he wasn't the one whom you're speaking of. No, not Horace. He was a little short fellow. Uh, but Horace would know him. Have you talked to him? No, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't didn't, no one knew where he was. Well, he's somewhere in DeKalb County if he's still living in Wichita. He, he retired a few years ago and they went, went to work over there. Did you know Bessie ago. Kempton Kroll? Uh, I vaguely. I knew her. She yeah. was in the Daily Report family. Apparently still is. Uh, Tom well, Camp described her to me as someone who was his uh, notion of what a woman politician ought to be. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, you know, she'd been in the state legislature, one of the first elected after um, she took her husband. Apparently she married, didn't marry until the late 30s. Uh, was Bessie Kenton when she was in the state, state legislature. Uh, Tom Camp describing Helen as, as someone who, you know, the way a politician shouldn't be. <laughs> Bessie Kempton Cole was uh, of the sort that a woman ought to be in politics. But Milliken described the women who've been in the legislature before Helen as kind of token representatives. Uh, women get the vote, so someone ought to be in the state legislature. And uh, these women were elected, but were never, as he said, very effective uh, until Helen came along. Um, but you didn't know her. I was wondering why. Well, I didn't know her, is that I knew that she was over there and that her, her family ran the Daily Report paper, which is a local. Uh, well, you know what the Daily Report is. Right. Did you know Jimmy Carter, by the way? Well, we had a nodding acquaintance. I knew him and he was like when I was uh, in our life, and, uh, but we had no contact. I received a nice letter from him and After you retired, when did you retire? Uh, July of 74. And then did you... Uh, enter into private practice there? No, I retired and ran for that judgeship. Oh, I see. I see. You spoke of that, but that, I didn't get that, it. That uh, election was in September. Primary was in September. Wasn't it September? August. August. Did you, um, you then really never, other than the association with Helen you were, and the previous association with Andrews and... No. No. In that uh, very short little period, uh, that I was uh, in the question of the FCC field. I spent from 52 until I retired in the agency. Uh, it, I don't know, I had the impression that you had been in the real estate business, but I'm wrong about this. No. I told you that I came up here. Oh, that's right, you were going to come up here. Robin. And you do not have any real estate interest in it. Not other than in my, uh, I uh, have that condominium in my It's probably up in Top County. You know, one of these primary places got into it. We have to find a buyer for it. Was it a piece of property? Yeah. yeah. But I never, you know, really Did you know that Helen was, I had a, it said she was elected president of Lodge Number 105 of the American Federation of Physically Handicapped. That's possible. Others, was officers were Joyce Norris, Francis Blackman, and Teresa Lynn. On what basis would she have been considered physically handicapped? The eye problem? In well, 49, I she really hadn't had those operations. Well, I don't think you have to be physically handicapped to work for them. Maybe not. Because <laughs> uh, I can get in touch with them and ask what the basis was. But I had assumed that one needed to be, one would have been physically handicapped to be Well, the only physical handicap she would have had then would have been the eye. I know of no other. But as this was 49, I thought, well, obviously she started having patient. some eye problems and was in the hospital well, as early as 46. She never did. Problem. <laughs> Her nephews, Randy, Jean's son, speaks about how she would come in family, one of these squabbly family reunions, and, <laughs> couldn't, and couldn't recognize anybody unless she really wanted to cut them out, and then she'd turn on them and know exactly where, <laughs> where they were in the room and who they were. <laughs> uh, according to Jean, um, the, uh, her sons remember Aunt Helen with a kind of a little, little sense of 
the ridiculous, you know. They, yeah. they, they, they apparently liked her all right, but uh, were not any special admirers. Maybe they got this from her father, if it's true, as Nancy said that uh, Dr. Smith wasn't an didn't, admirer. She didn't wasn't, like. She her. wasn't a, you know, the typical homebody female type that I suppose he thought all women should be. Yeah. You didn't know him, you said. Just, just when we had met him. Right. Uh, and the Helen herself never spoke about him. I think she admired him greatly as a doctor, and, and uh, she said that was the only thing that he was interested in was bones, and unless there was a bone around, he wasn't interested. He would go out on that lake and fish, and would spend his weekends just going around. He had one of these um, canoe-type boats with a little electric motor that would just go around the shore and go around and around, and, and uh, do a lot of fishing, but they, they didn't have any they didn't get together, except as far as I know, the only time that they ever got together was on Christmas Eve. Is it likely, I, I, my, it's my feeling that it is likely that he disapproved of a woman who <laughs> took that strong a position on behalf of herself, unlike Jean, who referred to him in everything. I think that's right. And you know, she wouldn't be above walking over him if she did anyone else. Because, uh, you know, being the big doctor, no one is supposed to question that. George Stoney, whom I've told you about, he managed to come in 46, um, admired Helen, worked very hard for her. He said the only thing that he had ever disliked about her was the way she treated God. And all of, all he really knew about her was, was in those days. You mean No, Guy he said that uh, he said he feels he understands it now, and that he understands that Guy loved her and felt and understood Helen's need mm -hmm. to have someone to beat on, perhaps um, someone who understood her need, and uh, but that he he says that at the time he always felt deeply embarrassed by the way Helen treated him. Um, Were you ever, did you ever have any, you were with her, at least were acquainted with her in, in the 48 campaign, of course, when, when this thing had really eaten into her pretty deeply. Well, he stayed pretty much out of her way. She would uh, 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 ask his advice on things or use him as a sounding board and listen to him. But, it, you know, his advice was contrary to what she wanted to do. Houston White said that he felt she would have gone much further in politics if it hadn't been for God, the two guys. Uh, that they discouraged her, kept her from really realizing her potential. I don't know if I've mentioned this. Yes, he went on yes. at some length about uh, Helen was married to the wrong person. Um, well, no one else would have put up. If she was going to be married, she couldn't have been married to anybody better than a guy because was the retiring willing to go along with all this business that she had. Uh, as I have said, I didn't see them together very often, but I never had the feeling. But I saw them days. He had his office and she had hers, and they had no reason to. Um, I remember specifically one day. Uh, uh, she was to be on the radio. Helen Bullard was up there. She was wanting to be most every day. You know, part of I was in his office and doing whatever it was that I did. And writing letters, making contacts with his customers. And Helen Bullard came waddling in there. Evidently, they had some sort of a rumpus that morning before they came to the office. Uh, Helen and God. God. And uh, uh, she uh, either said not to go with her to the radio station, or maybe he had told her he wasn't going or something. And, 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 
send you to go with him, and, you know, and then you know who loves you. And that was her way of sort of petting him up, so he would do whatever it was they wanted him to do. Helen Bullock said this. To God. And so evidently Helen was uh, feeling sort of bad about whatever happened and sent this emissary in there to ask God to go with us to the radio station. Um, I, I wrote to you about, asked you what you knew about the Curtis Bryant story, and you said that you had no... Did you ever talk to Curtis? Yes, I had a long talk with him. In well, fact, I'd already talked to him yeah, when I told you. Didn't you get the feeling that they had sort of, the uh, bitterness was passed before she yeah. ever... Yeah. Right. Um, and what, what he was what something over land, I'm sure. Well, he claimed, that, he claimed that she uh, attempted to appropriate out of the joint property, property which was not hers, well, uh, well, and he went to court, he took it to court. Uh, my question to him was, um, whatever prompted her to do this, and he said he has no idea. Um, his wife, uh, <laughs> well, I was attempting to talk to her, but, uh, to him and, and his wife, who I didn't really feel the need to talk to, at, at any rate, volunteered some information. And she said, well, there's no adequate explanation for it, she said, except that Helen was going through the change of life. And she repeated this. When I was down in November, I called Curtis Bryant again because he had promised to send me a copy of the, of the uh, court judgment in the case, which he says fulfilled all of his requests and requirements. Well, he, he uh, promised to send it to me in July and hadn't, so I asked him again in November, and he still hasn't sent it. But in the course of getting in touch with him, I had another talk with his wife. She repeated again this story, yeah. that it was just the change of life, which I think is rather silly, because I, I, yeah. I don't think that Helen was affected by the change no. of life at all. Really. Because I don't know it. Anyway, Mrs. Bryant told me a story, again, another story. She said, as an example of the kind of thing that was happening in those days. She said, we were down at the lake, and uh, of course Guy and Helen lived there all the time. They were down there on one occasion, and in the middle of the night, like three o'clock in the morning, Helen comes to their door, clad in her night clothes, knocks on the door, <laughs> said, could she come in? And um, they let her in, and she was in a great state. Mrs. Bryant said that uh, she explained to them that she and Guy had had a... No, it was Helen wouldn't tell them what had happened, that she just was, was sitting there. And <laughs> I can hardly believe Helen being without words. Anyway, Guy shows up at the house, Miss, again Mrs. Bryant, and explained to them that they'd had a fight over who was going to do the dishes. <laughs> 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 and, and Helen had said... Uh, it was Guy's turn to do the dishes, and Guy, had, for some reason, refused. And Helen had uh, gone in her room, locked the door, and had climbed out the window. This is what Guy told them, and had disappeared. And he didn't know where she was, and was simply looking for her wherever she might be when he went over to the Bryant's. At three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, and that the next day it was all over, and they never heard of that incident again. Does this sound like? This would have occurred. She couldn't tell me what day. I mean, what time? She I couldn't give me a year. I can't believe that they had. But did a, did they get a uh, fussing about who was doing dishes? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, did you ever? But have I know this. If Helen got that furious, she'd have just broken all the goddamn dishes, and there wouldn't have been any problem. Who was going to wash them? You know. <laughs> she'd have taken them out and thrown them against a tree, and that'd have been the end of that. Well, you you say this, but. Did you ever see her do anything this extreme? Um, no. Know anyone who... Uh, no, the only extreme thing that I... People mean, do give me I incidents see, like this. I didn't yeah. see it. Uh, but that was... Uh, the guy was telling me a little bit pieces about her fit of anger when she came back from the trip up, when she was breaking up everything that, in the house with the reminder of Junior. And she just smashed it all against it front of the tree out there. I think where that came up, I was down there the next few days, and this tree was just all battered. I don't want to go, what in the world happened to this tree? <laughs> it's pretty breaking up things. 
Well, she uh, she was a woman who certainly needed to have. Uh, she had absolutely no control over her. Right. But she needed an outlet for her great drives and energies and passions. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, would you think it true that it was in these last six years of her life, well, eight after mm -hmm. 48, she never ran for office again. Do you think that she had enough to do in those years to take up her energies? Um, or did she, <laughs> she was sort of like uh, beyond the pale politically, as you say. Mm -hmm. I believe, though you don't can't pin the date, I would suspect that uh, Everett Milliken mm -hmm. felt this, felt this in he, those years, mm -hmm. in those particular years. And that's why he didn't approach her with whatever it was he was supposed to have done, which I do believe was to let her know that he, he wasn't going to want to get more say so. Did you have a feeling a in a those years that she was a woman without uh, out of adequate outlets for her needs? No, I think she was sort of exhausted in those years. I mean, uh, after, after having gone through what she did, and just sort of... Do you have the feeling I mean, that she never really recovered? Yeah. That she didn't? She, uh, I don't think that she did. Uh, she recovered, but she, there were certain things she never forgot and forgave. Yeah. Were well, you, uh, with her, oh, oh, I know that you were close to her, but do you recall any of her reactions to the Supreme Court decision in the County Unit case, the one that we talked about that she uh, helped bring with Morris Abrams and Hamilton Douglas with her? Well, I don't believe that any of them really expected it to be a winner. You know, they expected to have to redo this until they finally lived with the competition. We they all expect it to happen. Yeah. Did she ever later, talk about anything? bringing another case? There were two others. Uh, the Hartsfield brought one, a mandamus. Well, they probably, uh, she was probably involved in them in some fashion, at least to the degree of discussion with whoever was bringing them. But she just didn't have the funds to. After she got through with that, those races and the expense she had, You, you've spoken about, and we, we've talked about I don't going know out of town with this small overnight yeah. <laughs> equipment. Um, what sort of cases would she have had that took her as far as California? Have you any notion of what that might have been? For instance, that particular one, or anything that took her out of Atlanta? I don't know whether that was a lawsuit or if that was, um, I don't remember why she went there. I was just wondering about the kind of practice that she had. She didn't have much of a practice. What she had was just for theory and stuff. She didn't represent any large company or anything. Yeah. And, no, no and it was not her wish there. to, was it? Well, and whether it was her wish or not, uh, yeah. large corporations just don't bring her. At least they didn't in those days business to a female lawyer. I would imagine that one with her reputation in Congress um, well, she wasn't and there long enough. Right. Well, but she, she established wasn't. a reputation, as we were saying earlier, yeah. on, on the left uh, wing of the Democratic yeah. Party. Yeah. And, uh, for instance, she voted against uh, business in the matters of uh, OPA and uh, case and strike bill. And, uh, uh, she was a big one on the Bullwick bill um, and the freight rate story. Um, so that she had a reputation for... Um, Right, and also of someone thinking for herself. Um, she she claimed that Harry Cooper, who managed Davis's campaign, had turned against her and went to Davis because she refused to get him uh, <laughs> an extra sugar quota, which would have required somehow bending or breaking the law. And she she told him that she would see that the law was changed, but she wouldn't do anything about breaking it. Mm -hmm. um, Cooper ran the Cooper Candy Company, um, managed Davis's campaign, and, and um, contributed money to the Colombians and, and yeah. these uh, crazy racial outfits yeah. that were 
actually had something to do with the atmosphere in the general election in November that year, about when she was in the writing um, I don't know, I guess that I really covered all the things that was in my mind to talk to you about. You know what might happen is that when you get home and <laughs> relax a little bit, you might have some ideas. Something might bubble up to the surface. If so, I'd certainly appreciate your call. Uh, or, you know, even after you get back home in Wisconsin. Names, yeah. notions, incidents. You had the feeling in the in the years that you knew her that. Uh, how did you describe her? And I have it here, so I don't need to have you say it again. But it was something like conservative liberal. I think she described herself that. Did she ever talk about the, the Negro story? You know, it was said that she was elected by Negro votes. And, and well, uh, sure. Davis. She said, "How? What else?" Uh, here I am, a woman, I'm in a minority group, so to speak, and uh, the Talmages had kept him like this under the tongue forever, and it was the first election. They would have voted for anybody against the Talmage cool. problem. Dr. So Baker, she was just caught in the middle of that thing. Dr. Baker told me that the reason that she won the black support in the February election in '46 was that they and as you recall, the white primary was uh, ended just at that point. But this was a special election, and there was no bar against their voting yeah. in any case. But because the white primary was coming to an end, they had been preparing and registering people. And they, they were realizing that their, the time was coming when they could participate again. So the black community decided to flex its muscles a little. And they had invited all of these 18 and 19 candidates in the special election to come and meet them at a dinner, uh, all a lunch. And it was against the law for blacks and whites to mingle. Um, but it had been done. It was repetitiously even at that point. And that Helen was the only one who answered, and Tom Camp, who was the leading candidate at that point, uh, didn't answer their request either yes or no. And because Helen was the only one who came, and she did come and meet them again on other occasions, but they felt that she, uh, she deserved their support. Right, for that reason. Plus the fact that she did have a very good uh, reputation in the state legislature, not on issues that affected blacks particularly, but uh, of a kind of a humanistic approach. And they, but they never did. Um, they didn't, contrary to what the rumor was, they never did say, we want you to vote for Helen Lincoln, they deliberately avoided it. It was never mentioned in, in the Atlanta Daily World. Baycoat says that uh, it was easy to... Because they knew that would be the kiss of death. Right, th that's his words, actually. And Baycoat says that it was easy to get the word around, however, that uh, the leaders in the black community mm -hmm. supported Helen, because all they had to do was to say, vote for the woman. <laughs> they didn't even have to mention the names. And, um, there was a higher percentage of registered blacks voting in that election than registered whites. It was natural, of course. But as we were saying earlier, it was just a... Uh, well, if she hadn't been caught in that, right, she'd she was caught there. in the watershed. Yep. Well, in my opinion, it's kind of why she deserves not right. to be forgotten. <laughs> because she, she was a good woman who got... Uh, Barbara by her times, and mm -hmm. yeah, it shouldn't have happened. And I think that uh, in Atlanta, they'd still like to forget her too many <laughs> Well, she could run now. Well, look at that. Coming out of there is. One person whom I would like to see, I don't know if he certainly was too young to have known her, but Andrew Young, uh, 
as he succeeded in the fifth well, district. Well, you have the Sutton, there were two Sutton boys, and the, the older one sort of helped pull manage, not with manage, but now it's sort of so-called manager, I suppose. He certainly did do a lot of work in the past for 40 years. Yeah, I thought that uh, Hamilton Douglas and M.L. St. John, somebody else whom I can't think of at the moment, has, they were from the dead. M.L. died about six years ago. He was a particularly close friend of mine. Um, well, Yes, she, and, it was uh, uh, right after the war when people like uh, Calvin Keitel, I, I've seen, and Harold Fleming, did you know these people? They were not newspaper people, but... Uh, uh, and I think this oldest Sutton boy was sort of the, the uh, chairman of this young group that was working with her. And uh, he subsequently... Press. International News Service in those days, I think, also was in existence. It became UPI. Uh, I think that's one of them. And I recall seeing the same thing there on that line. Howard Sutton after that. And I think he was, I would say, in his early 20s. but you don't have no idea where he is now. Well, no, but I, I've got a feeling that he's still in, uh, in that same business. He could be running the office right now. I don't know. Um, Ken Turner, who covered for the journal in Washington in those days, was not an admirer of hers, yeah. but his was a kind of feeling of uh, anti-woman. Yeah. Uh, he went to work for Talmadge later. Well, you know, Davis was one of several. He was about the last one that this group decided they couldn't have her trying to find somebody that would take her on and run against her. Davis told me, he said, I asked him how he decided. I somebody paid him something like $10,000 or something like that to do it. Paid Davis? Mm -hmm. Who Ooh. made the contribution to, to his campaign? One of the people I know they opposed was, um, he was dead now, so he did a good desk. He's a lawyer. John Bell Simon, I know, entered the race, actually. No, but they, there was quite a campaign trying to find someone. Davis told me that he decided to run After against her because nobody else would do it. He said, if well, I had... This was true. 
that nobody else in this group approached your students. And why wouldn't they? Because they felt she could win? Either that or they just weren't going to get into that mud sling that was required to get rid of her. You know. Mackie to told me that uh, the DeKalb County crowd felt it was their seat, and it had been DeKalb County seat for a long time, a very long time, and they were determined to get it back again. And uh, it's John Simon Bell, I think, rather than John Bell Simon, um, that they finally decided that they should get Davis because they really wanted to get rid of him out in DeKalb County. Davis, of course, doesn't tell it that way. Oh, of course not. <laughs> well, I hate to let you go, but I think... He did? Well, I mean, you know, after all, he is our congressman and my cottage. You can't go out with a life fighting. But Helen never did. Of course, Hamilton ran himself. He was on the council. For a judgeship. Yeah. He and, he and, uh, uh, Luther Alberson. Together. Well, I'm going to... I want to be upon occasion. Of course, you could always hear her coming down the hall, and she uh, used uh, just every other word was a cuss word. And that sort of set him and a lot of others, others back. He'd been sitting in the governor outside the governor's office one day, waiting to see him about something. And she came storming in at some appointment with her or some little something that had upset her and she was just reading this appointment clerk or whatever he was, secretary, out to a fairly well in front of this room full of people, of course, at the top of her voice. And he was, you know, he was just, how can that be a lady sort of attitude? And then he said to me, he says, you know, I never knew that a lady could swear until I met you. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning Helen. No, me. Oh. I mean, <laughs> did you swear as much as Helen? Well, no, but I could let it off pretty good when things weren't going right. And, and I never uh, heard Helen utter a, a word of profanity. Really? And so I suppose that only tells the story that I didn't really know her that well, or maybe didn't know her long enough. But because everyone says this, that uh, that she <laughs> that she did. That's <laughs> unreal. It was like it, it came at moments when she wasn't angry as well mm -hmm. as when she was. Right. Mm -hmm. Was this perhaps something that she did it's habit, I in, in, the, in the halls of <laughs> in the state capitol? Uh, Mackie, for instance, says that over in the Decatur courthouse that she swore like a sailor right. and all the time. And was it opposed? You mean opposed by people? I no, I, no, by by her. I mean, she'd get in the Capitol. As you mean opposition that made her do this? No, no. I mean that when she would arrive in the in the in the, <laughs> the Cab County Courthouse, or encounter some kind of opposition in the state capitol, for instance, that she would. Uh, uh, this was the way she got attention. Yeah. This was the way she captured attention and held it. Uh, it was something that she did uh, as a pose. I, Oh, opposed. I thought you said opposed. Well, I think it may have started out that way. Because, of course, by the time I met her, she had been picking around the corridors of the Capitol for 16, 18 years. You get on that telephone.
That's what he remembered about her. Occasionally, he saw her there in the outer office, the governor's office, and how she was cursing off his bird and seeing that she made this appointment. Um, she said, and one of the stories in the newspaper that I collected, that when she and her sister made this trip in 1922 to the West, cross country, through pastures, <laughs> no roads, it was an old car. Not an old car, it was a fine new car, as a matter of fact. The Maxwell people uh, gave them the car, they, they got the car for the publicity. It, uh, Maxwell people got out of it, that she was at that time looking for the possibility of I would imagine it's after There's a man at the hour. desk uh, there if you park in front he might call up to you and stay out in front if you came to the door unless you couldn't leave the car there in front Find it open. Do that, yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I was wondering if perhaps it wasn't getting a bit. Turn the floor down again. I'm so thirsty I could spit. Go ahead. Should we order up some drinks? Would you like a drink? Oh. <laughs> Would you like one? <laughs> I'm drinking so much through, through the holidays that I don't... No, I can do something wet. Well. So. Well, anyway, what, what she'd said at the time she made this trip was that she was considering the possibility of settling in the West because oh. she'd just gotten a law degree wasn't congenial, the atmosphere in, in Atlanta wasn't too congenial for women lawyers yeah. at that time, but that she had uh, not found any place that uh, supplanted her love of Georgia Pines <laughs> and the feeling of home, which of course as she's been born and raised there she had, but did she ever talk about, at any point did you ever hear her say that she regretted living in Atlanta? No. Oh, stay. No. Um, when she was in Congress, you know, she and Emily Taft Douglas, who was the wife of Paul Douglas, who yeah. was congressman from Illinois, Illinois had uh, thought that they had established that, that she had established some relationship with Paul. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, family bloodline. Anyway, she was a good friend. Of the they spent there, the Douglas, differently. When he was too rest at some point, he called on the snow and made it too rest. Uh, no. The, um, the time that she was in Congress, there were three women. Mm. Douglas one was Douglas. Alan Douglas. Yeah. Alan Douglas Langan. Emily Taft, and the only one, of course, Melvin Douglas, who was Alan Taft's husband, was a George, but it was a changed name. He was Jewish, and I don't know his original name. But it wasn't that. Um, we used to, on Sunday afternoons, after we had dinner down there. Bob and I, Guy and Bruce would go out walking or climbing around her living room, big fireplace, and sofas, she'd get on one and I'd get on the other and we'd turn on the 
five wide and take a nap. According to Nance Downing, um, not only did Hamilton, her brother, drink heavily, and this apparently is an established fact, I saw it in the letter, yeah. and, and, uh, but that the old man also... Her father, yeah. yes, I did. did. I didn't know did he... Did he die of some drinking disease? I don't know what he died from. Um, I don't think he was too old a man when he died. I'm not sure what he did. Record that I have in my have a case full of notes at home. I thought I'd bring the things that were my helpers. Hamilton Jr. could put it away pretty good too. He was uh, not an alcoholic by any stretch of the imagination. Probably could have ended up that way had he lived and not been ill. Um, it was a, it's a brain disease, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Peculiar yeah. thing. Um, Nancy Downing says that uh, Helen was the only one in the family other than the mother who had the brain. Uh, and that he, she includes the father as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know him. He established that duel, which evidently they managed to make a living out of. I don't know if. Uh, uh, well, did you talk with uh, Cecil Cole? Oh, oh yes, Herschel. Herschel, 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 Herschel
down to it that it was his he career or hers, and I think he had. To, you know, he, I, and I doubt very much that he would tell me this, and I think that I can write what I need to write, although perhaps I ought to say to them. Well, give him a chance to, what do you to have deny to, it. To say today, yeah. um, the, the, the complete record of the hearing is there, plus um, a good many other statements that were published at the time that he said he didn't want to be put in a position of having to make this decision. It was the wrong decision for him to have to make. I don't suppose that Helen Bullard had uh, uh, any notes or anything to back to her. No, she had no. She did. I talked to her at great length. Uh, I talked to her a couple of hours. Uh, she. Um, I wasn't too sure that Helen Bullard's sympathies were still totally with, or ever had been totally with Helen Rankin. Well, Did you I have that the, feeling? For instance, she spoke about the, the jingle that Helen had used in his February 46 campaign against Tom Sam. It had to do with, uh, I've been working on the railroad, and this kind of woman named Ruby Folk had written the lyrics. And when I was down in November, I got in touch with her, and she uh, remembered the lyrics and told them to me. And it was, it was fairly innocuous, but Helen Bullard had just, uh, the reason I'd wanted to find out what they were was because Helen Bullard had described it as a scurrilous song. And it wasn't really scurrilous. It was just <laughs> sort of uh, uh, homey. And uh, everybody used lyrics. I mean, little jingles. Uh, Talmadge had some. And, uh, it wasn't an unusual thing to do. Uh, so I, I wondered if she. You have uh, the subject, uh, the campaign literature, and so forth. Do you have a picture of the 48 of the chief? Uh, I have the I one in 40, the, 46 for the one. Probably the last uh, photograph that she had done. I have one frame. And, don't have and it, it was the one used in the 48 mm -hmm. Um I have this really rather handsome one that was used in 46. I don't have the negative, I mean the, the glossy of it. Uh, but I do have the... Uh, I really haven't gotten around to thinking about pictures, but uh, it would be well too, I'm one. sure. I, I could send it to you to all places for whatever you should make of it. Like well, it would you? Of course. Um, I have, uh, Nancy Downing has a couple of pictures that she said that she let me use. She has this one. But I was with her on the setting for the photographer, this photographer, that all of her. Uh, Helen Bullard had described the one that she used in 46, uh, of which I have numerous examples of. I don't, as I said, remember the glossy. But Helen Bullard said that she, uh, that Helen Mankin had adored the picture, and that she often had it copy on her desk and would often look at it and say, oh, you beautiful creature. <laughs> I don't know if it may well be the same one. It, it did somewhat flatter her at that yeah. point, which is not the case. Well, and she has her head sort of like this. Maybe she did that wrong. Of course, one of the things that Davis incessantly harped on was that Helen had exaggerated all of her accomplishments in Congress, and that she dissembled and lied about what she'd done. What did he do? She did more than six months, and he did all the years. Of course, it was fairly, you know, fairly common among politicians to, to do this kind of thing. He, um, oh, he picked up on articles that the Communist Daily Work was in She, she, when she came to Congress, she was so different from the other ten Georgia delegates mm -hmm. uh, that, well, there were ten. She, there were nine of them who voted. To the way they didn't want, and yeah. she showed up from Georgia voting like no other Southern mm -hmm. congressman had. And so they ran stories about uh, 
what a good thing this was out of this house. But Davis used it as a The whole thing had not gone well. Or was this the way she always drove? Well, she was a fast driver. She was a good driver. She was a fast driver. And uh, evidently she took care of her automobiles because, uh, but on that particular occasion, I know the radiator just dried out. Quick. I guess and I. All it was was the water. I don't recall having to stop anywhere and get anything fixed. It was run the water out of my paint. When we had gone, made that trip, probably driving up Route 29, probably you had done yeah. the same thing because I don't think there were any big throughways in those days. Um, um, she had hired young Estelle Gaines from the Journal to be her press secretary, so the three of us were on this trip. She was going to Washington to be sworn in to come. And I had just learned, well, learned to drive. I had, had just gotten my driver's license. And in Georgia in those days, they would license almost anybody. They would go in and take a small test. I had taken a driver's license, I mean a driver's school uh, course, which couldn't have been more than three hours, and then I'd gone to the Georgia State Patrol and gotten my license. I don't know why or how they licensed me, but they had, and because I didn't know how to drive from Adam, but <laughs> I told Helen, yes, I had my driver's license, okay, I could spell it, and I did a hideous job, nearly wrecked us, and Helen, I can't stand, <laughs> if ever she would have cursed I would think if that would have been I the time but but I don't remember that she did um, at any rate I might well have wrecked her career <laughs> my own too of course at that moment she would never have gotten to Washington to go through all the agony that she later did go through. I, I don't know if I mentioned this but I guess it was Nancy who said that she thought the afternoon that she was killed it happened at 2 30 in the afternoon mm -hmm. And you said that she'd had a, been into town to lunch? I don't know what she was into town for, but she came by my office just before she went home. Yeah. And Nancy I don't re if she said what she was there for, I don't remember. Nancy well, said she thought she maybe she'd there. had too many martinis for lunch. No, because she was perfectly all right when I saw her. She just came in and and uh, we chatted a few minutes. And she was on her way to go get her car to go home and wanted to be sure we were coming down that weekend. Not uh, uh, martini up, uh, she was driving her usual fashion. Who knows where that bird was that she hit? It could have been on the wrong side of the road, I don't know. Well, um, no, the story is as the obituaries have given it. Um, and the, the, it mu this must be a fact because uh, it was a raining, rainy afternoon. And she, this, you know this old road down yeah. to College Park. Uh, it was none too good in those days. And it's now well, been She went down the expressway and cut across going back to 29. Oh. And it was on that road between the end of the then expressway and then 29 that this happened. Or oh, was it? Yeah. The expressway was made even in those days? Well, it was down that far. Well, some, she passed someone at College Park who you know, knew her and recognized her. Uh, it was four lane to Griffin before they ever built the expressway. Now the expressway consists of some parts of 41. It's not really uh, I-75 and I-85 run down through there. And they still use some parts of the road. Anyway, someone, she passed someone who recognized and he uh, said that the road was slick um, and that she had, uh, so it is assumed, the, the man whom she hit said he, that he saw a car sliding toward him and uh, that he couldn't get out of the way. That's why he was um, I think that she didn't have to the rubber on the car or something. Just slammed on a spot. Right. But he was not, uh, he was injured slightly but not, uh, not badly, and she was smashed up. She never sued the estate. I don't, uh, uh, Margaret has no record of this. Um, whether he 
did, I don't know. I don't, I suppose that you know that uh, all the Washington papers the next day, I was living, we were living in Washington. I lived many years. Um, ran long, long stories about it on the front page. Carrying full details about a trip out west, everything. Um, <coughs> I'm sure that you got a copy of the Atlanta papers. I'm sorry. For a day. Oh, you just had a large story. Yes. Jean gave me all that she had collected. The only things that Jean has are obituaries and, a, and some family papers. Uh, <coughs> stories about her, uh, and she, she's given me the whole scrapbook of the trip west, not given me, but loaned me for my use, and um, I, I think that that's a good story in itself. Mm. So, it, yes. You know, speaking of her writing, she did have a, a facility for writing, and she and she loved to uh, uh, make little jokes in, <laughs> in her writing. She, she wrote with a humorous, in a humorous vein. So that might, she might well have done well at writing if, she, if she'd gone on with it. Did, do you know anything about her brief writing ability? Did she ever write a brief? She did, I don't know. Either. Or did she hire someone else? Or maybe she never had occasion to write. I don't know whether she did or not. not well, I was associated with it. Um, well, like so many lawyers in that time, it got to, I mean, you went through the first round, and if you lost in the lower court, you just quit. You know, it, everything wasn't appealed like it is these days. So whether she and her husband agreed to uh, writing experiences or not, I don't know, but I sure have had that. My husband teaches law at the University of Pennsylvania, but he, uh, I've heard him talk a lot about legal writing classes. How did they do that? No, maybe they always did. I, for several years, and I went from that to the juvenile court after golf set up to prosecuting and their operation. And in the last two or three years I was the DA's office president, then serving as the third district attorney. And uh, I was sort of, uh, he didn't have a first assistant. That's where I was. The first assistant office was there taking the, you know, the public office of him. And the only VA we had there because his office, the door wasn't open to anybody who wanted to come in there. But the times had changed. So, anyhow, I was in that office. I You have no intention of going back? No, I work? discovered that I could live on this pittance that they pay me. <laughs> and, uh, what do you have, a pension? I, yes, I was, uh, after 20 years of service, I, I, my pension was with the district attorney, judges, the solicitor general, retirement thing in Fulton County. And after 20 years of service, I uh, retired half the day. So at age 55, which I had just made uh, a year in 55, 73, and uh, so I stayed over until July 74, and the boss didn't have any income or notion of what it was, except for two or three people that I talked with, that I wasn't even thinking about running for this office. And, uh, who did you say you ran against? Jack Eckridge. Um, uh, uh, yeah, they both strapped the judges who never wants to send anybody to jail and they think that it's always somebody else's fault that they're in trouble. So I had uh, a raise coming in on the first of July, but I didn't know it was in the works, so I, I retained my retirement until the 8th of July to so take advantage of that additional $500 a year. <laughs> so they think, well, 
what was there. And this was a state court judge. Yeah, the, the uh, so Superior Court of the Atlanta Judicial Circuit, which is just Fulton County, but it's called the Atlanta Circuit. And is that the judgeship that, uh, such a judgeship is what Tom Camp has? When I went there... No, it Tom was in the civil court of Fulton County. Civil court. He said it was the civil court. Civil criminal court. Civil court of Fulton County. Unless they changed it, they may now call it the county court. I'm not sure. He was, he was not on the superior court. Right? I thought the civil court is what I wrote. No, he had retired. Was I wrong about that? No, I went to the courthouse. Many his chambers. Yes. He was constantly talking to you know people coming in the office, which he told me would happen. I told him, and he was signing papers. So he's very active. And he said that if he'd gone to Congress, he probably wouldn't have had this good job and pension rights. Oh, and so. Well, they've got pension rights for themselves. I don't know, you put it something like, she did him a favor by... Uh, yeah, in, in retrospect, it was a favor. Although he uh, could not conceal the bitterness that he still feels. She had no business winning that election, I said. Well, it was running, I suppose. Yes. You know, it's not about it. Secretary, this Lulu Clements that we talked about, did she leave before you became? I never knew her. So I don't know just where she did she, did she leave to get married? Or I think so, because they moved uh, north and I have the impression that they were up there in New England, I think somewhere. That's why I thought maybe Guy Jr. would know where she was. I didn't actually ask him, but uh, uh, he didn't know where last step on it. Well, she must, she moved back to Macon, I know that. Maybe she's not still living. However, she was pretty healthy. She, she was in the hospital, too, right after they married. I don't remember what was wrong with her, though. She had some kind of an infection. She was a bit younger than that. I would say that she was uh, not a good bit younger, but she was younger. She had been a teacher. I had the impression that she, I don't know that she retired from teaching to marry him. I thought I had the impression that she was already retired. Made her any younger. No. He, uh, if Helen died when she was 61, and he was younger than Helen, he could hardly have been more than 60 or so when he died. I know that he had a serious intestinal operation. Okay. And is that when he died? Um, I hadn't heard from Helen in the last... She sent me a, a present when my son was born in 54. that when we were down there in 52, we stopped by on a visit from my family. On the way back, we stopped by with Bob Lott, and his wife. And I knew that he'd had a serious operation. And I thought he had died perhaps before she did. But uh, well, I later learned, of course, that he survived it. Um, the first time they was better. I don't think Helen could have functioned without him at that point in time. And, uh, in a way, he was, she still had the hang on to him. In spite of all her bravado and loudness and so forth, uh, she was very dependent in many ways on Guy. His 